OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. And you think there's photographs of that? No way. You're very welcome along to uh, Wednesday morning's OTB AM. It's Jerno with you all the way through until 10 this morning. If you want to get in touch with us, 087 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can always get us on the YouTube channel. Oh, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Good. What's the crack? Oh, look, it's, uh, well, the, the football's back this weekend. The, it is. The long, yeah. bleak midwinter is over. I just had, to, had to, to, to check myself there for a moment. I was like, well, there's uh, AFCON on, there is Premier League on at the moment. There's ah, there's only one football There's only one ah, football that matters no, to you. We've started a culture war accidentally. Yeah, that's it. It's the only thing you can do on a Tuesday morning, isn't it? Are you going to Newbridge? Did I say Wednesday? I might have said Wednesday at the top of the it show. It is definitely Tuesday. I was I probably it wishing it away. I'm unavailable this weekend to travel. We're, um, every single second is busy at the moment. With uh, we've, we've moved houses recently, as I told you. And so. You're missing the glamour tie, so. Yeah. Yeah, Jack O'Connor thinks he's going to get a good reception. Yeah, well, why wouldn't he? I mean, he brought, brought Kildare to, uh, to a Leinster final. Yeah. Uh, they managed to ho- hold a they candle land, to Dublin. Did they land a glove? Did they try anything? They, they tried They tried to land a glove. No, they didn't. I mean, they they da- sat back and put 15 men behind the ball and did uh, nothing. Uh, um, Daniel Flynn scored an incredible goal. Well, uh, yeah, in the like 57th minute. Yeah. It was almost as if... These are the moments you live for as a fan. It, it is. We've got this thing which is good, which we could try. Let's not do too much of that. No. It, the weird thing is it was straight knockout too, right? So like your plan was to draw the game nil all and maybe win on the day on penalties against the Dubs? I mean, that it would have been plan. it would have been the first team to get, get a draw uh, against Dublin in quite some time, so I think uh, at least the, at least the intention was there. How did it work out? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it didn't finish Not to nil mention all. that it was a Dublin team who it turns out were on the ropes, who we'd seen be on the ropes against Wexford and Meath. Mm. And then we were like, no, that couldn't be. They're, yeah. they're saving it for the Leinster final. So if we try anything, we get humiliated. And sure, look, I don't know. Our, our, we're not here for a long time. We're here for a good time. Yeah, the, like we're not the, even here for a good time. I mean, <laughs> there's uh, what was it? It was probably what it was certainly single figures that that they won by. And um, I, I don't know. Like I mean, like the, taking that result away from last year wouldn't have been the worst thing. But obviously, there's there's more than just looking at the result. There's the context of how it happened on the day, and it definitely felt that it wasn't that there wasn't too much of a an attempt to try and uh, upset Dublin or try and disrupt them from their rhythm on the day and Dublin kind of Dublin kind of brought themselves back to Kildare's level at, at many times themselves on, on, on that occasion it kind of felt but uh, like surely I mean it, it is the, the time to be excited as a GEA fan now are, yeah, are you not great. looking at know, what, what Kildare I'm, are going to bring to the table this I'm, year and thinking this yeah, is the year of course like of course you're genuinely excited because this is the bit where everybody believes that anything is possible I mean it just uh, I think the Irish Times have gone through Division 4 and Division 4 has Andy Moran, it has McEntee, it has David Power, it has Cavan. It has like an interesting bunch of people who are involved in, that's just off the top of my head, um, uh, Carew and Carlo has a big, big job on his hands, but obviously knows the inter-county game incredibly well. And London have their first uh, London-born manager, which is also pretty interesting in terms of the evolution of Gaelic games in uh, in England, and in London in particular. So I like, there's a uh, there's a gajillion storylines. Your power rankings will obviously have to be updated in real time as we go through this with uh, with news. And I'm looking forward to that. So yeah, I'm genuinely excited about it. But um, like, I don't think Kildare fans feel like they, supporters feel like they owe Jack O'Connor anything. I don't think that at all. I mean, if we were to go through it, it's like a, there's a bit of Johan van Graan situation where everybody assumes this is rolling over to the next year and then all of a sudden it's not. And it's like, well, off you go, you know. Off you go. So, uh, and even in the end, the Kildare County Board didn't really do that. They waited for Jack to make the decision that he was going to go after he said he was interested in the Kerry job. Like, so, of course, it seems like the Kildare County Board are still on good terms with him. But, I don't know. I'm not saying that they should get a bad reception, but, like, they don't owe him anything. Mm. Like the, the thing is, about it, what tends to happen with Kerry managers is that the worst receptions they get is at home as opposed <laughs> to uh, on the road. So uh, I don't think he's necessarily got anything to worry about going to Newbridge this weekend. No, I don't think so either. I think um, Kildare fans will we'll give him a welcome. Yeah. You know, we, we know you. It's like, a, it's like an ex you're frosty with, but not, not particularly, you know, I'm actually pretty glad you moved on. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you've got something way better now. 
Like exactly, and uh, maybe you weren't necessarily sure at the time whether or not you could upgrade. Uh, but uh, it, never, it never felt right. It never felt right. There was there, there was always like a, there was just a, a blockage between us. The couples therapy would have been very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> why, why why can't you commit to us? Well, Man United. I mean, Man United are my first love. Why can't you commit commit to us? I mean, I'm kind of committed. I'm pretty committed. We're a little bit pregnant. It's uh, it's always an encouraging thing to hear. I'm I'm kind of committed. I mean, exactly. That's, that, that's, yeah. That's, I mean, you know, you're, confidence filling thing. You're not bad. You, you, you're okay. You got you got stuff going on here. So like, it's pretty, pretty talented. Uh, you're okay. There were elements of you that I like. <laughs> <laughs> Whisked away in the dark of the night. Well, you know, just the whole uh, over there, the shiny thing. <laughs> there, people wake up the next morning and and they're gone. Just uh, never to be seen again. And and with it comes a weird sense of freedom. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, oh look. Oh, what we needed was right here all along. Yeah, we looked inside and we found ourselves. That's what I. That's, what, like, that's how I think it's gonna. It's a, you know, these relationships are are, are complicated. Uh, uh, like the, the the freedom that that comes with it is that is that going to to be good for you though? That is that is the the deep question. You, you may feel run, you may yes. feel happy now. In the long run, in the long run, there will be something will happen here that is sustainable. There is an identity that will emerge. Everybody who who comes through this setup will be involved with people who believe in the setup and believe in our collective shared future mm. as an organization. Like injecting something outside is is like metaphorical steroids, which never last. Yeah, the impact of which there was there was no there was no significant. I don't know. What well, can, can I ask? What uh, what percentage? Of uh, a Kildare fan, are you? Like what? Like I do. You, like as a fan, forget the football team's potential. As a fan, do you think you're reaching your potential? Like, do, you, do you think that like it's getting that that your heart has been extracted, all the love has been extracted from it as possible? That this team has done that for you, or do you feel that there's a lot more love to give, and that you will get there over the next little while? I guess it's a question about how much do you do you reckon Kildare are going to be successful over the next little while? Ah, look, I mean, I, um, I have that, I have that hope. I think there's a really quality team on the field and I think there's an even better backroom team has been put together of of good smart people who are intensely committed to good outcomes on behalf of everybody who loves who loves the team that's a, I, look I, I maybe I'm maybe I'm I'm over egging this a little bit but like we've got the right people in charge mm. and there's a load of them like this is a good thing. We're just doing what every other county do. <laughs> like if you look at the other backroom teams, everybody puffs, puffs up their backroom team with people that, like, uh, they're particularly they feel will will bring something. And Kildare have done that because like they've got everybody together. It's great. Why? What I'm, you- I'm, I'm just curious. I'm literally just like, what? Um, how, how much? How, how much more love have you to give to this thing? And and what? What is? What, what, like I mean, if, if you go back to say like the late nineties. What version of the Kildare fan existed there compared to the one that's existed well, for that the last was, few years? That was um, that was a, 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 an awakening of that was a, a flowering of like literally seventy years of pain belching out over uh, a couple of summers. Like because so uh, in ninety seven they got beaten by me in the three game saga and that was it. There's no back door, so like you had to wait the whole way to go to ninety eight and then that's like this long summer of amazing outcomes which we had never seen before so that's like nothing for my generation nothing will ever be the same as that right and that's why there's so much power in the people who've come through and I really hope that they can um, capture a little bit of that but I guess for the the McGinney era fans that was fairly similar because again there's this long kind of period of getting beaten getting beaten getting beaten best players uh, being unavailable through injury and illness and then the team comes together and then the Kildare uh, County Convention in their wisdom decide to get rid of McGinney. It's like, how do you do it? So I'm hoping that self-sabotage is gone from the environment, like the the the, the Politburo. I hope that's gone. You would feel it would be gone. But I don't know. Well, if it's a good season, I mean, the, the way things worked out at the end of last year, like it wasn't an easy time to be involved in Kildare GEA, so it would be encouraging on two fronts. 
firstly on the football front, but secondly on the political front as well, that they had arrived at the right decision eventually. Yeah, somehow. It's hard to, uh, you know, you, yeah. I didn't see the homework, you know, so I'm not sure. Yeah. We're just that uh, we're, we're completely basing this on outcomes, I guess, or hoping that the positive outcomes are going to come. Um, as, a, as a Kerry fan, how excited are you? Are you actually more concerned because you feel like there's an, uh, an All-Ireland to be blown here rather than one to be won? Oh, yeah. An All-Ireland to be blown and an All-Ireland to be won and an All-Ireland to, be, to not be in the mix for. Like, I mean, it's all... all it has to be in the mix. If you're, not, if you're not in the mix, it's an absolute disaster, isn't it? Yeah. Like that, 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 that's fair but enough. It's, it's Sam or Bus this year for this team. And it's and it was last year and the year before and it is every year really isn't it like I mean there's I I, I bought a year ha- is there less of a first year bounce because this is a third time round manager the retread of of Jack O'Connor has it comes with it all the baggage and experience but that if this was say one if this was mine who got it would there be any honeymoon period. Um, maybe I, I I'm I'm not sure. Like I mean, I, I think that there is still a, a new manager bounce. It does feel it does feel new and different, doesn't it? Like it doesn't feel it's a long time. It's ten years, and sure, there's a lot of the players who would have played for him with the minor teams. There's a lot of players. Well, a couple of players who would have played with him at the senior team, and he when he did last manage a team, and there is just kind of like a, a different feeling to things that if that Jack is almost coming in to, to finish off a job that had been. Uh, in the process for the last little while that they're just missing that final piece of the jigsaw and hopefully the manager is the, the person to be able to do that. Like, right. So I mean, he he is the jigsaw final piece. Well, clearly like I mean that's that's what that's what the that's what what it will be if they get over the line this year because there will be a couple of personnel changes here and there but the the managerial change is clearly the biggest one. Clearly the players are finding the new manager bounce. I mean they're they're asking to come off the bench in games and that was the story, wasn't it? They're uh, really, he said that the, it wasn't the player welfare injury. So this is uh, John O'Dowd. He, he was doing press that Jack O'Connor. This is um, uh, three or four times I said, and this is the two lads who who played for Tralee IT in Tralee, and then drove to Kill and All. Is it? Is that where the game was? No, where were you? Temple Tuhi. Temple Tuhi, which is um, about a hundred kilometres away. Uh, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, north, north couple, of, couple of hours. Yeah, yeah. So it was a four hour round trip or three and a half hour round trip, whatever it was. So they played for Chile IT in the Sigerson, and then they played for Kerry that night. And there was um, um, Ray Canellan said it was stupid and a bit brain dead. He described that decision. So Ray Canellan of Westmeath, um, who was playing for UCD on the, on the day, I think I didn't realise that actually. Uh, Jack O'Connor says three or four times I said to them, lads, sure, there's no point you coming on here. And they said after coming up. Sure, we'll stretch our legs. That's all. That's all. That's to it, really. Of course, I got a bit of flack after, and maybe some of it was justified. But you're looking at two young fellas, one who wasn't on the panel last year, the other who's been injured for the bones of two years. They're stone mad to play every minute for Kerry. Do I see it as any great player welfare issue? Not at all. No. In actual fact, player welfare is mental as well as physical. If they went up and I didn't give them a few minutes after going up, I think that would be harder on them, which is kind of the opposite to I told them not to play, and then it's like actually you know I had to play them because otherwise it would have been. So it was a welfare issue, and he's it's a it's a it's a mental welfare issue yeah. as opposed to a physical welfare issue, but it's not a welfare issue. So I don't know. Look, player led environment. Put me in. Put me in, coach. Yeah, but sometimes someone needs to be the grown up and say, it, 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 if it is only fifteen minutes and the game is over, you know you can do the warm down. It, I don't know. But Look. the 50 minutes and the game is over is a ridiculous argument, isn't it? Like, as, and in fairness, it's not. Uh, Jack's obviously going to defend that because he's the person who's who's the manager. But like I've, I've seen other other people make that argument as well, and it just doesn't stack up. I mean, there's 50 minutes left in a preseason game that's already dead. There is no need to be putting players Look, through a second player game. Like that is. Uh, I, I think it's uh, again. I understand why somebody within the camp would say that, but. Um, I think people would have maybe uh, green tinted spectacles on from the outside to actually say that. Listen, uh, the, the fifteen minutes thing is, is the reason why they should be playing. It's it's the exact opposite. Um, Daisha dude says Kildare GA is in a good place. Leinster final, the club football nice, winning the Leinster intermediate hurling and progressing to the All Ireland. Not only is the dream team in place in the football, it's also in place in the hurling with David Herdy. Nace is one of the most progressive hurling clubs in the country, and they're doing unbelievable work at underage level. Like that, uh, Nace has the potential to become. Like uh, Kilmacud Light or something like that, oh, like a, oh, a, a super oh, club. Oh, you can't say that. They were they were very like, oh, you can't say that. Why? Because um, well, they don't feel like they they are that. But like the rest of the country has been looking at them, kind of going, really hope they don't get their shit together. The rest like of, it's the rest of the town, right? 
Which? It's a one club town. Big population. There would be other clubs close by who would be taking players. But yeah, it's a ma- it, they, they like, and it does seem like they've completely got their house in order. I just want to see, like unfortunately it didn't happen this year, but Nace making all Ireland finals, that the, the Nace ball gets painted blue and white. That, that's, <laughs> that, that would be peak. Uh, that's when Nace will know that they made it. Uh, Meath and Kildare are the Haas and Williams of GAA. <laughs> bit, bit harsh, is it? Of Leinster GAA. I don't know. That's actually that'd be even more harsh. Um, I guess I guess they feel that they've already always got a a dog in the fight. Maybe maybe that's the the comparison there. But Hassan Williams would be bringing up the rear, wouldn't they? Like that's you've got to go down a, f- a few more divisions, I think, to, to get the Hassan Williams. Yeah. Who are Hassan Williams? The, f- the Formula One team. Okay, 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 okay. I mean, uh, Williams uh, long storied history. Has who were they before? Were they somebody else? The, the American upstart. Right. Uh, morning lads after your chat with Mike Carlton I watched the highlights of the Bills Chiefs game says Shane what more could Josh Allen have done maybe call heads in the toss <laughs> that's it I saw a um, very valid point actually which I didn't realise till after we came off here yesterday that Chiefs had two timeouts uh, and we were obviously making the very reasonable or was it was you or, or someone you were, you were making the point that listen they're going to try and um, they want to keep him away from the sidelines basically at that point despite the fact that the Chiefs had two timeouts in the pockets anyway so they should have just packed the middle stopped the run and we could have been talking about Josh Allen going to a championship game today yeah there's, a, there's a, look, over the course of a game like that you're, you're going to second guess every single decision but um, yeah I I've never know. seen quite a reaction to a weekend of American football quite like it as in like all the minutiae in this part of the world for, or, yeah and also also even like in the States as well the, the sort of the, just a volume of, of moments that were uh, that you could talk about that were endlessly fascinating uh, like it's just in the, in the space of one weekend for all that stuff to come out it's it's probably once in a once in a generation sort of stuff Alright 7.47 this morning OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette Good morning Start with Gillette Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors Here's what's coming up Best sporting apologies Ron Nogar is going to join us at uh, 10 past 8 unconnected to the sporting apologies of course Sports pages at 8.30 Sports news at 8.40 with the latest on the horrific scenes from the African Cup of Nations where there are multiple deaths after a crowd crush uh, Liam McCourt is going to join us at 8.50 ahead of her All-Irish clash for Bellator Tom Parsons CEO of the GPA is going to join it's 10 past 9 and then we'll hear some uh, Pat Nevin thoughts on the situation at Everton in particular around about half past 9 we'd love to hear from you 87 180 is the WhatsApp number if you want to get in touch with us and of course you can always leave a comment on the YouTube stream as many of you are doing and we'll get to those in just a moment but Owen over to you yeah so uh, as we think as I think everybody knows at this point this has very much been the season of the footballers apology we've been treated to some of the great most necessary apologies in the history of human civilization, with footballers apologizing, apologizing for war crimes such as missing penalties, red cards and other such atrocities. And the most recent of these was just last week, which Thomas Partey uh, got on terms with. He released an official statement after Arsenal's exit from the Carabao Cup. He said he was responsible for anything that happened against Liverpool and will take all critiques. And to make sure you know he meant it, he printed it on headed paper with the Thomas Partey logo and signed it at the bottom. So such an amazing display of apologising got us thinking, just how does a sports person compose the perfect apology? And we've gone through some of the most important apologies in history to help us through a five-step guide to apologising good. Step one is find decent reason to apologise. This is textbook stuff. An apology isn't worth the headed paper it's written on unless you've got good reason to apologise for. We know that satanic acts such as making errors in the football pitch deserve full contrite apologies, but there are other things in football that also deserve the apologising treatment. Take, for example, impaling a teammate. Uh, in 2015, St Mirren captain Stephen Thompson drew... Uh, he took a spike training pole out of the ground and threw it at his then-teammate John McGinn, striking him on the thigh and causing severe bleeding. I'm just mortified by the whole thing, he said at the time. It was a daft prank. It wasn't like I threw the pole out of anger or anything like that. That's not what happened. Bottom line here is this. If you're wondering whether or not it is suitable to apologise, ask yourself if you put somebody's career in danger. If the answer to that question is yes, you can go ahead and apologise. Step two. If possible, blame the whole thing on something cute and or cuddly. So if you're running a sporting organisation and you can, if it's within your capabilities, to blame a small animal or a baby 
or maybe uh, a mascot for your misdeed, then you should absolutely take that advantage. In 2014, the Jacksonville Jaguars mascot, Jackson DeVille, went for the nuclear option when trying to slander the terrible towels of the Pittsburgh Steelers. The mascot showed up with a terrible towel in one hand and a sign in the other that read, Towels have Ebola. <laughs> Jacksonville apologised at the time, saying, Improvisation and humour have both been key elements to the character of Jackson DeVille, especially when he performs at home games. On Sunday, the person who has played Jackson over the past 20 seasons made an extremely poor decision in that regard. The team was unaware of this inappropriate sign which was handmade by Jackson during the fourth quarter of yesterday's game until after it had been displayed. We extend our sincerest apologies to anyone who was offended. A shrewd move by uh, the Jaguars at the time, I'm sure you'll agree, directing all the blame towards that pesky furry animal. And you can take note of this, Bruno Fernandes, the next time you miss a penalty, before you apologise, ask yourself, is there any way I can throw Fred the Red under the bus for this particular misdeed? Step three, is uh, use your apology to distract from something else. This is a, a very, very good one. Do not let a good crisis go to waste. So where possible, try not to apologise for something until you really need the apology to cover for something else. If you have to wait one or two years, no problem. If you have to wait 17 or 18 years, also no problem. Here's Pat Spillane apologising for something he said in 2003 in 2021. That word puke football... I only mentioned it once ever in my life and it's something that has stuck to me. That's fine. Uh, and it's something that they said the shortest fully constructed sentence in the English language is I am sorry. I am sorry for saying that. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Of course, in the same broadcast, Pat Blam pointed out the vacuum of information that existed around the Tyrone COVID situation at the time. They said that Tyrone had played a blinder in the build-up to the game. So this was your tactic, Trojan horse move from Pat Spillan. Using the apology was like a way to break down the defences and then launch an offensive with whatever agenda he pleased. And it doesn't matter if you use misinformation as well during this. He said Tyrone were the team of the decade or something like that. Uh, <laughs> not true whatsoever. That's the best that, apology of fine. all time because yeah. it, it, it corrects the record on, on multiple different fronts. It was it was a humiliating climb down on behalf of all of Kerry. It was jazz hands. Jazz hands using whatever information he Had to work out in the uh, end. And I appreciate it. I mean, let's... What happened uh, that day? I mean, a long time ago at this point I mean, we'll, we'll eventually we'll eventually get to that we'll eventually get to coming to terms with that one day in the future in I 20 hope. years time uh, step four when in doubt do the exact opposite of what Richard Keyes would do so this is the first thing you learn in apology school when in doubt about apologising do not do as Richard Keyes does so uh, plenty of you will remember the apology interview he gave on TalkSport after his scandal at Sky Sports but I'm not sure how many of you remember the job <laughs> the video editors at TalkSport did editing the interview into a dramatic YouTube clip. We're going to play 90 seconds of this because it's magic. And just remember, I did not touch this. This is TalkSport editing their own interview with Richard Keyes at the time. There are some dark forces at work here. <laughs> Many of the people that I've been sitting, reading, who've been making judgments on me, I know very well. Very well. I rang on behalf of Andy and myself Sunday afternoon. I made it an official apology, which Sean accepted. She and I enjoyed some banter together. I was wrong. Andy was wrong. We were both wrong. Our prehistoric banter is not acceptable in a modern world. Rio, are you telling me it doesn't take place in the Manchester United dressing room? Because. My information is it does. Sure. You know, it, it doesn't really matter what I feel, does it, about me? It, you know, it's an irrelevance. I, I, anything I say now, you'll get another text in a minute saying, ah, oh, he's whining about himself. I'm not. It doesn't matter. I tried to ring Karen twice on Sunday night. She didn't answer the phone. There is no answer phone. So I text her in case she saw a number she was unfamiliar with and didn't want to answer it. I said, Karen, it's Richard Keyes. I very much need to talk to you. Could you please take my call or ring me back? I tried to ring her to say sorry. And she didn't take my call. If, if operating in the manner that I do, staying away from red carpets, staying away from tweeting, staying away from blogging, keeping myself to myself for my family, if that's aloof, I'm guilty of that as well. <laughs> I think, uh, spoiler alert, Richard Keyes uh, stopped being aloof uh, oh, yeah. a short time after. Check out his blog. Just for uh, com completion, they ended up on TalkSport presenting a show for a long period of time after it's a, this. It's a good point. Yeah, yeah so that was, the, that was the, look at the numbers this guy's doing. Let's get him in. So... Mm. 
It's a, it's only a section of a of a longer clip that's a, available on YouTube. Richard Williams in the Guardian at the time said, "As exercises in damage limitation go, it was like walking into Versailles Hall of Mirrors wearing a suicide bomber's exploding vest." So the apology at that point didn't necessarily uh, go down well. So basically, when in doubt, do the opposite of what Richard Keyes would do, uh, which brings us into the, the Karen Brady bit's amazing. Oh my god! So just god. explain what's going on there. So at this stage, obviously, uh, Karen Brady is a football executive. Um, was she at West Ham? She wasn't at West Ham at that stage, or she wasn't so. at Birmingham, right? So anyway, and I, would this be before she was? This is a long time ago, isn't it? This is twenty eleven. So maybe she was already on The Apprentice. I think she was, yeah. right? And she had written an article criticizing them. Yeah, and he's like, "She won't take my apology." Who is she? What? She won't take. Who does she think she has not taken my apology? That's what that was. No yeah. answering machine. I was like, "What? She case my number. What? I must be allowed to apologize, and you must accept it." like oh, that's not really how this works Richard <laughs> that's not how it works yeah just one of uh, one of many many amazing moments in that then, my apology then there is like the, the the BT apology well not the BT apology the BT interview he does then a couple of years later uh, which I thought was like uh, only maybe a few years ago from, from this point but actually it was 2013 and it, there was a very sort of oh let's talk about this ancient history thing it was like that was only two years ago <laughs> Um, You're still the same. Still, yeah, still very much. Yeah. Um, step five. This is the final step. Uh, when in doubt about apologising, just be Eric Cantona. So today, on this day in 1995, Eric Cantona's kung fu kick sent shockwaves through the Premier League. But uh, the resulting flirtations with an apology should be a lesson to all wannabe apologisers. So here is Cantona talking to journalists at a press conference shortly after the incident. When the seagulls. Follow the trawler. It's because they think sardines will be thrown into the sea. Thank you. It's a beautiful analogy towards the the media there. And then uh, a Nike ad, which shortly followed, uh, came out, and this is where Cantona did indeed apologise for his misdeeds. Make an apology. I made some terrible mistakes. Last year, in a certain final victory, I only scored one goal. Against Newcastle, I put shot three inches wide of the post, and at Wembley I failed to complete an trick. I realized this behavior was unacceptable, and I promise not to make such mistakes again. Thank you. There you have it. Take note, any wannabe apologisers uh, and enjoy a long and fruitful career in the Premier League if you can follow those five tips. But uh, yeah, Eric Cantona, 27 years today since uh, the, like one of the most uh, incredible moments in the I, history of football. I think I, it's almost underrated how unbelievable. Has anything ever been as big a story in the Premier League ever? Well, like I, I obviously don't remember the, the story itself, but it's like, I mean... if you If it was to happen, like... It's hard to it's hard to compare then and now because obviously there would be everybody would have there would be a million different angles of it now whereas actually there's the one angle really I mean there's probably some others in documentaries that were, have emerged over the years where it's slightly different and you might be able to get to see Matthew Simmons in the crowd it's an early bath for you Mr Cantona which is definitely what he said um, <laughs> and I, it's like it's shocking to me that it's that long ago. But also how uh, how underrated a story this is in, in some ways. Like he gets banned for a period of time, but then comes back and is unbelievable. Yeah. Whereas now I don't think you come back. Yeah. I don't think you get to come back at all. You get sacked immediately. Ooh, you reckon? Oh, you cannot wait into the crowd. <laughs> can't can't kung fu kick somebody and oh, yeah. batter them because you're you're an athlete who who like looks after themselves and does weight, and you can do damage to this. Yeah, like, of course. I, you know, flabby lout. It's like it's an un, it's a mismatch. Yeah, no, I, I said that. And you get sued by your man, no matter what he said. Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe. Maybe they have a Cantona clause on all the the grounds at the moment. Enter at your own risk of studs to the chest or something. Perhaps, like, you know, you know the like, I mean, the the classic phrase. I'm not sure if you subscribe to this notion that you know I'd, I'd rather get a, a punch in the face than a, a spit in the face. No, gonna, you don't buy that clearly because I was going to say that you know. No. Like spit a, on me, spit on me, don't punch me. Because <laughs> I, 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 obviously when you like go through apologies and stuff like that, one of the first things that comes up in relation to football is, is Jamie Carragher and, and his apology on Sky after the spitting incident. Oh. And that was that was a career that he's put back together pretty well and he obviously, um, I mean, ma- ma- maybe it's different as a, as a pundit as opposed to a footballer. That's from his car. 
that was from his car, yeah, driving down the motorway. But um, like that, like does uh, a modern day kung fu kick uh, would that have led to a sacking as opposed to spitting at somebody? Is is, is what I would. I think uh, if you kung fu kick another player, you're grand. You get your six month ban, whatever. It's like oh, oh, this guy's dodgy character, and all the, Nigel the, Young, all the all the usual stuff happens, right? Um, well, the. De Jong was accidental. Whereas, so if if you if you on purpose were to do what Maradona does sure. in, that, in that fight, right now, except it was kind of it seems like it's unprovoked, right? You're you're in a lot of trouble, but you're getting your career back. If you wade into the crowd now, doing what Cantona did, I'm not sure you get your career back. I'm certainly I don't know, but like he came back and was the outstanding footballer in in England for the next two and a half, maybe two seasons, maybe a bit longer. Mm. It's like and wins a league by scoring the winner in every goal for about nine games in a row. It's yeah. like, it's mad. Like, and I'm sure that there is a huge degree of anger influencing the level of performance at that point, but not only from him, but also from like Alex Ferguson, who like comes to his, not comes to his defence, but like takes Canton by the hand and is like, right, let's get out in front of this. Let's kind of, let's be contrite and let's try and accept the ban. And then the FA way into proceedings are like, oh, you've said you're going to take a ban, but we're going to give you an even bigger ban because we want to be seen to be doing something here on this occasion. Maybe they were right, but I think that they were, the FA were like on a big power trip. Well, uh, but I think way. the FA were like, yeah, 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 right, you're right. We are, yeah, we, we, yeah, uh, we've got no power now. We're exactly. taking our power. Yeah, we are outraged. Oh, you're outraged too. But we're supposed to be angry at you. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, what do we do here? <laughs> And they got I, they got a bit confused. I, Eric Dyer waded into the crowd about twenty months ago. He's still oh, at yeah. Spurs. So yeah, like, it's it's not the same. It's a good point. He did he did wade it's, into the crowd. Did but he, he didn't, did he kung fu he, kick he somebody go, and batter them? I don't think so. He just had a chat. Yeah, like, it's completely different. Like um, and actually, Derek Dyer got in a lot of trouble for that. Mm. Like there was, ooh, what, what's his character? It was like he's protecting his brother, wasn't that? Well, that was that was this, yeah, yeah. Like I mean, I think, I, I think it's very different. Imagine James McLean went and responded to somebody in the cloud in the crowd yeah. the way Cantona did which yeah he I wouldn't uh, wouldn't be a fan of seeing what, what the outcome of that would be uh, to be honest that the, the, the book we get thrown there to, to say the very least his like, career in England would be over 100% like the like one of the, 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 the kind of funnier parts of, of all this was this, the, the sense of injustice that people felt had been meted out to Cantona and maybe you can make an argument that the, the length of the ban was Maybe a little bit longer. I can ex- I can see why people would make that argument, but you'd like um, people with like face paint and say, saying Eric is innocent and all that sort of stuff. Being like, I mean, there is pretty uh, clear footage right there of of what what he actually did. In uh, in parts of France, it's taken as a, a, a term of endearment when you kung fu kick somebody and um, and batter them. <laughs> it's like uh, it's considered you know a, a mating ritual. Um, uh, Twenty, I can't believe twenty seven years. 27 years. I wrote my first piece of journalism about this in the Kildare Nationalist defend, oh, no way. defending Eric Cantona. Oh, well, what, what was your uh, reason for defence? <laughs> well, I just thought that like, if you're taking crap from people in the crowd, you should be allowed to you know, not take that crap. And there's always a massive overreaction in these situations. Um, uh, what would the apology be for uh, Danny Rojas for killing the dog? <laughs> God, you can't apologise for killing an animal. Killing an animal is the the, the lowest of the low. I mean, that's so that uh, would be a very contrite apology. Like, I, I, I just don't think there's any coming back from from harming an animal. I think that's that's that was so, accidental. So, like, still the dog dies. I mean, there's there's a website called Does the Dog Die dot com where its sole function is to tell you whether or not a dog dies in a movie because people are so traumatised by it. It's not do you heads get severed in this movie or whatever. It's Does the Dog Die. I mean, I presume Marley and Me features. Spoiler, first of all, for <laughs> anybody out there, but I, I, I suspect it does. Um, yeah, we need to dig out this Kildare Nationals piece. Is there like, an, is there a good archive? Is there like, can, I don't know. can we get a premium subscription? Uh, I don't know. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with a new and improved razors. No room for Tiger Woods in the midst of this. The great sports apologies. Like I mean, it's. I think we've, t- we've taken all the lessons we can from from Tiger Woods at this point. Like, Nathan pointed out that his mum was sitting in the front row. Yeah. I mean, he's apologising for like having a lot of sex. Yeah. That's a tricky enough situation. In retrospect, like it was all fine, and then I didn't. I didn't realise. I mean, I'm obviously at the time. Would have realised, but like, that's hard. They made that. They they added a little wrinkle there. It's like, oh, you're going to have to explain about 
I mean, I guess she she knows what he's like, but she's probably read the papers and uh, she like. I mean, I, I but there's a difference between reading the papers and actually like face to face. Look, ma, I did all these bad things. I, I, the stuff they're saying in the papers and the stuff that you're seeing at the supermarket tabloids. You know, when you're piling up your shopping and it's me and it's Elin and it's the kids and it's like 19 other people. Uh, it's all true. That's a hard conversation to have. Yeah, yeah. I like. I don't, I don't think she showed up though. Thing like and and was completely uh, what? thrown away by the events. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what? This is the first I've heard of this. Well, I thought you were announcing your comeback. No. Um, yeah, no. That's oh, like it's, it's such an like. And Nathan also mentioned the the oversized suit a little bit. Oh, like I guess it's uh, another sort of jazz hands moment. Look at the look at the the, the big jacket on me. Yeah. Well, a uh, part of that is look how small I am. I'm I'm cowed by this. I'm I am broken. You know, I'm not the thrusting because you know. Normally, he's like, look at my muscles. Mm. Couldn't do that because it would be like, well, well, I really apologize for here. Look at, look at me. <laughs> I mean, look, look at this. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's true, actually. That's, uh, that's a good PR move, actually. Oh, one on one. Cor Sheehan. Some connection? I'm sure there is, yeah. Cor Sheehan. Tired and emotional, the best apology of all time. It, did he do it? Did he, was it? Was it a written apology or was there a, a verbal. I don't know. I'd, we should do a deep dive on the tired and emotional scenario. We definitely should because I don't... It's 20th, 20th anniversary this year. Oh, it is, is it? Yeah. All oh, right. It's hard, 20th anniversary of tired and emotional. Roy, uh, uh, Dunphy. Oh, sorry. Who are you thinking? Uh, Brian Cowan. <laughs> 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 sorry, of course. Uh, it's 20, is it not 19 years this year? Is it not 2002? Uh, <laughs> yeah, what year is oh, this? Oh, it is 2022. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh Jesus <laughs> Christ! I forgot what year it was. Uh, like we're twenty five days into the year. That's not I lost a year. It okay. been, it Everybody's been lost like, a year. We've been doing this for two years now. Yeah, sorry. And also, I mean, I, I can't believe I can't believe I the the Brian Cowan tired and emotional is ahead of. Um, maybe, don't my um, maybe maybe that was the uh, original original of the species. Six minutes past eight this morning. If you want to get in touch and tell us what year it is, oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty is the WhatsApp number. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Shifty Lad wants to know, will Adrian Barry be in Cusick Park to see our mighty Wicklow travel down and surprise the naysayers? Tell him I'll buy him a can of Fanta and a pink snack. We have found that um, the supply of snacks, not great, and GA grounds. Oh, terrible. but pink snack has been discontinued, as we all know, as a, as a, as a terrible, terrible slight on our nation. I don't know why they did that, but they did. But and also, Adrian will not be travelling to Cusick Park. I, I dare say, no, not at the moment. Although who knows? Everybody, were, th- things change quickly these days. Seven minutes past eight. It's time for us to turn our attention to rugby. I'm delighted to say Ron O'Gara is with us. Ronan, good morning to you. How are you? Sure, How are you doing? Very good. Um, the, the, the we talk about Six Nations and the, and the squad and, and who should play and who shouldn't but before we get to that it's a couple of players who aren't in the squad at the moment and they're the Tens at Munster um, we've gone from being very concerned about the future of the Ten at Munster to being like ooh all of a sudden there's massive strength and depth and real competition so is Ben Healy just top of the tree slightly at the moment or what's the what's the pecking order from your perspective? Yeah, it's, it's a good question everything I suppose the, the buzzword at the minute is game time isn't it? Uh, and you can see, especially with young tens, how they uh, are improving when they get to play uh, in big games. And I suppose they're the only big games have been cast away. Um, Wasps at home, probably Ulster game as well. But in, in terms of, I suppose, how it's viewed with Heineken Rugby in, in Munster Champions Cup, Munster, it's always a step up. Um, but um, um, Ben Healy was really, really good at the weekend, I thought, and the fact that um, I think we were... Well, it's been probably well said at this stage aware of his kicking strengths but he looked uh, he looked like an all-around 10 uh, really really comfortable and really exciting at the weekend and that I, I probably hadn't seen that before in his game and uh, it was really promising to see that so uh, it was probably strange I think from the outside and that's always uh, interesting when you're in the camp in sport that uh, you would have thought after uh, the cast game that um, um, Crowley Jack Crowley would have retained the position, uh, considering how well I suppose he game managed and mental resilience in that game. Uh, but then it was strange to probably see uh, Healy being being drafted in, uh, because it is probably another position where I think you'll see huge progress too when when guys get three or four games in a row. But with the strength of competition in Munster, that doesn't seem to be an option. So I suppose for Ben Healy to come in. 
Um, and play like that, it, it must um, speak volumes for the way he's training. One thing that we've seen that Leinster have been able to do is they've been able to keep almost everybody happy over the last while. Now, there's obviously a breaking point at some at some point, and maybe there isn't. Maybe the, the two Byrne brothers can stay there together if, if Sexton finishes up in the next 18 months. But is there a template there for making sure that Crowley and Healy and Joey Carberry all get game time and all play for Ireland and all feel like their career is progressing or is there just one out half too many there at the moment? Yeah, it's a um, very interesting question. I think how you can keep, why it works in Leinster is the fact that um, i.e. with the Crusaders, their silverware, that, that's where you get buy-in from everyone because it's, if you lose, I suppose, the soccer analogy, it's the fact that when players going back over the ages, probably when they stayed with Barcelona and they were happy to play a handful of games, they knew at the end of the season that they'd get a medal. That was the same with the Crusaders, where you get buy-in from the squad players, the guys who play four games in the season. But when they play those four games, they've been playing a positive growth mindset for the season and they feel that they are uh, really valued and they prefer to kind of have their medal at the end of the season with the Crusaders then be a starter with the Highlanders or with the Chiefs, for example. But that that can't happen in every club because, you know I mean, only one club wins wins silverware. And uh, in, in, in Leinster's case, it's more likely there than Munster over the current, uh, I suppose, data for the last 10 years. So with Munster's point of view, with three tens, um, poor old Joey Carberry has been injured a lot. Uh, but when he has had a chance, I suppose, to present himself on the training paddock on a Monday morning, he has done a lot of good things in a green jersey and in a red jersey. And then the other two now are picking up, are picking up the scraps from from when Joey isn't there, but they're making a go of it of their own now. But between the two of them, uh, it seems that probably two of them is probably sufficient, but then you obviously have the hangover of Joey Carberry lurking. Ben Healy, in the aftermath of the game the other day, Ronan, was saying how Stephen Larkham has been such a great help for him, has been such a, a great guiding force for him at Munster over the last little while. It feels that Stephen Larkham's time at Munster has been judged on the style of play at, at Munster, but perhaps should we be paying a little bit more attention to him as a number 10 whisperer almost? Yeah, I think that's always, always in the background in... in in um, in every club, really, I suppose, the people, you know, including coaches that are ex-players when they go into a club, uh, they have obviously innate detail on one position, especially and in Stephen Larkham's case and in my case, it would be uh, uh, an old half um, scenario. But sometimes that that can work. Uh, negatively as well because the shadow may be too big and it may be too difficult because you're comparing um, you mean the current crop to someone like Stephen Larkin and Stephen Larkin was for people who was an exceptional exception exceptional rugby player he made it look very very easy uh, and for for coaches sometimes to think that well why why do you find that difficult sometimes you have to step back a bit and never assume and go well this is uh, his understanding of this may not be where it needed to be. So that that whole, um, I suppose, relationship on, it's easy in the fact that, yeah, I played in that position, but when you're getting down to improvements in the game, it becomes a little bit more detailed and deeper than you perhaps uh, appreciate. But um, for Ben Healy, for, for Jack Crowley, for Joy Carberry, to have someone like Stephen Larkin there, there's... Uh, it would be a huge, I suppose, uh, missed opportunity if their three games didn't grow. And maybe you may only see the growth of that when he, when Stephen has gone 12 or 18 months because it actually takes a little bit of time for ideas to to settle into and to be understood in, in younger kids. And um, and I think um, they're lucky to have that opportunity. And they are so young in terms of out half and the, the age profile of when we expect out halves to reach... Um, particularly in Ireland, their uh, their full evolution. I, I did want to ask just generally if there was um, signs of the game plan finally coming to fruition. Neve Briggs makes the point um, on the Red 78 podcast about uh, intention for her as a, as a coach now that she's coaching is more important than execution. Are we trying these things? Is there a pattern beginning to evolve? She said that she could see over the last few games they were trying stuff, it wasn't coming off. 
it started to come off at the weekend. Um, perhaps the truth about Munster is closer to the weekend than it has been the previous few weeks when you take into account the fact that they had all of the COVID issues where half the squad was marooned in uh, South Africa for a period of time when the big games were supposed to happen and we were supposed to see this, they didn't have the opportunity to put that out. So I'm wondering, is the truth about Munster, it was never as bad as uh, people said. It wasn't maybe not quite as amazing as it was at the weekend, but that it's closer to last weekend than the depths of, say, the the Connacht game in particular. I think it changes very quickly on and I think you nearly have to go through particular games to get I suppose a real um, a real detailed opinion on that and the fact that some games when you watch um, you, you you kind of have to I suppose that for me there will be question marks over certain uh, decisions in terms of why slow it down to go to a box kick as opposed to I think what suits Munster and which was very evident at the weekend watching the game was um, the crowd are just only dying to get in behind the team. Like the, the the energy the crowd gave, gave the team, I think, convinced them to play with tempo, even though they'll say that they were playing in front of them. But the flip side is that is that you mean the, the, the team that played in Wasps away was a team that hadn't trained very much together. It was a two weeks build up and they played probably uh, without expectation and, and without fear and it made it for a quite um, deadly uh, I suppose combo and potent, potency to their game um, so uh, the thing about you mean the tactics and and, and the game plan um, players do have to have to um, have to own that and the fact that so much of it is very very um dependent on winning collisions and when, when you're winning collisions then you can get to it easily if you're not winning collisions and the ball is static you, you kind of revert to type and revert to type is is chasing box kicks and winning the air and, and that serves them uh well to a point but i think um you can see now that they're, they're probably they have so many good players that um they can play both games can we talk a little bit about the Ireland squad then? And and um, there wasn't a huge amount of turnover and a huge amount of surprises in the 37-man squad that was selected that's going to go to, to Portugal ahead of the tournament. And so therefore you would assume is going to be the backbone of the actual competition itself. There are a few names who we haven't seen that much of who are playing really, really well at the moment. And in particular, it's um, three Ulster backs really and, and maybe Coombs as well who are on the fringes of the match squad and who we'd all love to see play. How does Andy Farrell manage the expectation of the IRFU to win the tournament, uh, his own desire to create a squad that's ready for the World Cup and then rewarding the form of those players who've played potentially the most rugby because of COVID but actually are playing brilliantly as well? What, what's the, what are those selection meetings like and how does he decide? Yeah, it's very competitive now. You might think it's easy to pick 37 but another name jumping straight out of me is Kieran Frawley who... Who didn't make the squad? If I'm correct, this yeah. this week, this time, and uh, you mean for me, he's the probably the nearest thing to an Ireland major that we have on, on this side of the hemisphere. He looks so adept to either playing ten or twelve that second receiver role. He looks so so interesting as a player that you can. He has, I think, the physical attributes to play a direct game. But then his, his feet are excellent. His passing game is excellent. I think his his recognition of space is very very good. Um, and he seems to be a threat every time he plays. So for him not to be in whatever the best 17 bats is probably um, incredibly disappointing for him. Uh, and as you mentioned, there was three other, I think, um, oh no, the three Ulster bats have made it into the squad. Yeah, Balakoon and Lowry and Hume. Yeah, Lowry is just, I think you look at the ease at which he glided past Morgan Parr. There aren't many people who do that. Uh, over the last 12 years and he did it with ridiculous ease at the weekend in Raven Hill. Uh, so he looks like his acceleration is, is very, very interesting. Um, but 15 is a very, very competitive position in the fact that Keenan just seems to be uh, churning out those 8 out of 10s every week, every week, every week. And just that's what teammates like in the fact that if there is a one-on-one -on -one, and there rarely is a one-on-one -on -one for Leinster, you look at him getting back, I think, off the interception from from uh, Bath's first try at the weekend. Uh, 
you know, obviously his desire, but also his speed and his, I suppose, his capacity to get back and put in a try save and tackle. They did score it, but if there wasn't a support runner, uh, you mean they wouldn't have scored. So Keenan did the business there, but he's doing it on both sides of the ball. Um, and that's what you expect, obviously, for a, for a team that's um, riding high after a very impressive November series. So, yeah, competition for places. And, and that's what you look for with coaches, that people come into the camp with a pep in their step and you know straight away that the training is going to be competitive because people are looking, well, how do we get into this 10 here, i.e. the best uh, 10? You're going to be picking 10 backs for each game and 13 forwards, and that's that will make for interesting trainings for Ireland over the next 10 days. The automatic reaction to what you're saying there is that how do we get more Kieran Frawleys into the system as in uh, I don't know whether or not Lowry can can make it as a as a 10 potentially over the next little while and the same goes for number the 10 or for the other 10s potentially moving back into midfield or in, into full back but how special is it what Kieran Frawley is doing or to be able to have the specific skill set to be able to play those couple of positions because I think we kind of talk about it in a very simplistic manner yeah, exactly. You look at obviously the, the the potential combinations they have at Leinster in the midfield, and it's it's scary really how 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 many options they have. But I suppose what um, jumps out straight away is the fact that um, you're probably advancing their development if if they're playing in a in a in a Premiership or in the top fourteen or in a URC that's competitive, but it's not competitive. So they're not developing probably, um, I think, as fast or, or as necessarily as quick as they should be. And, that, and that's not to knock the model at home. I'm just saying what, what's available, I suppose, overseas in the fact that when you have a kind of a, a genuine kind of top 14 or you have a genuine uh, uh, premiership where there's massive history and pride involved in winning that competition that doesn't exist I mean, for the Irish, Welsh and Scottish provinces it's all about Europe but those Europe it's obviously reduced down to four games and then it goes to uh, obviously the back to back in, the, in the, the last 16 quarter semi that's not enough games for anybody and I think people, what happened before with a lot of the provinces is carrying big squads you don't really need to be carrying big squads anymore because of the games the games are cut and when it goes to Six Nations time you're playing against teams that are missing other um, Six Nations members so the mismatches that are happening that had been happening for the previous years but I mean I think Leinster no matter what gear they were they were winning by 40 or 50 points I think um, players develop better when they're playing um, I suppose tight, tighter games with less and that's when you can really balance your squad and the fact that you can have turnover when you start 15, then you might have six changes next week, you might have three the following week, you might have four the following week, you might have seven the following week, you might have won the next week. But that's how I suppose uh, you get, I think, the best out of, out, of your, out of your squad. It's hard in Ireland the fact that they have the Champions Cup, but after that, um, I don't think the URC is the, is the model uh, at the minute. Uh, would it be the model if we were all able to go to South Africa and go on the South African tours and the best South African teams were coming or is actually uh, is your instinct that this yeah it could be it could be Ger, but we've had COVID for 24 months and the planning I suppose and the fact that that was always going to be uh, things weren't going to get get better in that regard so um, it, it, it's interesting you mean are we going to go to the same season model there are so many questions that are, that are left to be um to be answered at this stage. Yeah, and in the meantime, as you say, the provinces are carrying these massive squads and trying to keep players happy. And like, if you think back to your own career, if you were one of the three uh, young out halves at Munster, I can see why you would be fielding calls about maybe spending a couple of years abroad. It, it, but it's just that's that's the strength of the of the provinces and the Irish model. You you, you don't you don't have any interest. I think that's changing probably now with the generation, but from my time, it was all about playing for Munster and you did absolutely everything you could and there was there was no other club that matters. This is what I want to do, get to Tom and Park every Saturday. Then you taste what a European day in Tom and Park is, but then you just want more and more and more and more. And 
if there was two fellas in your position or five fellas in your position, it didn't matter. You wanted to play, and that's I think that's why a monster. Um, well, certainly had the identity that it had, and and you look at the weekend where um, <clears throat> you could just see the place is just waiting to take off again. I I feel from watching on the outside that the, that the crowd are just trying to get behind this team and give it a big lift because confidence levels are a little bit low there, but uh, it can come back so quickly with a few performances like they had this Sunday. That's why the decision around the head coach is so important. We didn't talk to you about Mike Prendergast uh, he, during the week. He was on a podcast saying he's not sure, he doesn't think, wasn't, and obviously he's not going to say on the podcast, yeah, uh, yeah, come and get me when he's in the gig at the moment. But you you definitely, you, you talked about him, I think, in um, December in the Examiner. You still really feel like he should be part of the coaching ticket at whatever level? Well, he's pure Limerick. He's pure monster. I think it's that's hard to beat in, in the... Uh, with the timing of that, I think he gets the he gets the local game. He gets the importance of the AIL. He gets the importance of players uh, feeling uh, comfortable in themselves, being able to express themselves. I suppose being authentic, having that capacity to express themselves. He he he's you know what I mean. He's grown up in Limerick. I think he, he knows how monster tick that's very very important irrespective of the style you want to play i think his man management is exceptional i think his mindset is very very good i think uh looking at the outset and i don't have any i suppose knowledge of what's going on there he he would be a, a huge addition to to um to monster but the reality is he's coaching one of the best teams in europe in, in Rasson. so um you know what i mean he's a competitor he wants to to get better he wants to win titles he, he's you mean on a good run with Rassen, they're probably lo- looking good in the European Cup this year. So I suppose it, it's a huge, huge decision for him. Um, but in terms of, I suppose, uh, rugby thoroughbred, he sure is one of them. All right, sounds like Munster would be uh, would benefit massively from that injection of, of somebody. And there's not many people who have that kind of combination of experience at the very top level and also a connection with the with the uh, with the city, which I think is hugely important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't. You know, he's done hard yards. He's gone from like obviously, uh, interestingly, left Munster probably as a player before anyone would even have thought about it. So that obviously shows for me that he's a little bit different, and his way of thinking is a little bit different. And he's gone from uh, Grenoble, Ajax, Stade Francais to Racing. He's seen so many, I suppose, different coaches from all over the world. That's what you get in the in the French game and. I think he's never lost, I suppose, his his roots and his rocks and what he stands for. Um, and uh, he's pure Limerick City, uh, but he's he, he, he knows exactly how he wants the game to be played. And I think any players that you come across that have left him um, have been hugely impressed by him. All right. Last question for me then is about um, Balakun, obviously playing really well at the moment James Lowe is out is it the team is it do we really just start the team that beat the All Blacks at the start of the Six Nations to get a win on the board and maybe if sub in Balakoon for James Lowe and away you go or would you like to see more changes no I think we could spend hours on this uh, between the three of us picking a potential team or predicting predict or potentially predicting five different teams for the games because huge thought will go into this how you go about it uh, I know from a player the, the massive, uh, massive uh, criteria objective on round one is getting momentum. So there is a little bit more pressure on winning your on your first game up at home to Wales. Uh, but um, Ireland have the cattle to do that. There's no doubt about it. Balakun, I think, will uh, will start. I'm not too sure will he start um, the Wales game. He could do, but I think he'll definitely start the Italian game. Uh, and as you say, uh, the Six Nations is where you see uh, someone uh, of his capacity, whether he's able to make the step up. Everything points that he will be able to. I think it's a little bit more forgiving starting a guy in a Six Nations game, especially be it um, Italy, Scotland and Wales in a home game as opposed to Twickenham or France or Stade de France. That, that, that's not really setting up your debutants to succeed, but it, it potentially can also. It can be a very brave call. It can be rewarded because uh, the other option is um, you start them on the wing in, in New Zealand away from home. 
but I think for that to happen, you'd probably like to see how he goes in a Six Nations home game first, then a Six Nations away game, and then, okay, well, um, if he's finding a strap saw on the wing against New Zealand, you know this guy's here to stay. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, getting close to squeaky bum time. Ronan, good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers, lads. Thank you. It's Ron Lagarde well, giving us his thoughts this morning. Uh, what do you want to see? Do you want to see like the all singing, all dancing, stick Hume, Larry and Balakoon in the team for the <coughs> Wales game? No, a combination is pr- probably the best bet because you want to give these guys the best opportunity to, to excel and to, to not even to build up relationships but just to, get, to give them the best chance of, of succeeding. And um, the Wales game didn't exactly go well last year. We want to win this game. <laughs> well, exactly. We do. Uh, there's, there's like a... I, I, the, the tension between trying to build a massive squad so no matter what happens if there's an injury or COVID crisis around the time of the Rugby World Cup right that you have a bunch of players who have some experience versus the just want to beat Wales mm. just want to beat Wales yeah and like I mean the it's, it's going to be one of the wingers and it, there's potentially then a, a question around your, your halfbacks as well because like, I just think Hugo Keenan and your midfielders are just undroppable at this point and in, in, a, in a way that doesn't make any sense if that your makes. midfielders are undroppable which so Bundy's dropped well, well, he started against. It's a, it's a, it's a good point, and I mean, so uh, of, I mean, I mean, jumping, I mean, jumping Hume up beyond okay, yeah. one, of the, one of those three. Yeah. But for me, it's going to be well, I, I, I don't know what it's going to be. But if I had to pick it now, it'd be Henshaw and Ringrose. But, um, but Bundy is so well liked and has been so good recently. Who's on the wing? Because Lamar's in the squad. Yeah, Lamar's in the squad. So it'd now, be Lamar's a bit of injury. Uh, Lancaster's in the papers today saying he thinks. Larmer, uh, he thinks all the Leinster players are going to be fit to play. That that was what he said. So we haven't had an update officially from Ireland. But uh, is Larmer ahead of Balakoon or is Balakoon ahead of Larmer? That's a uh, like it's an impossible one to call because Larmer's in the situation now where he's also trying to fight his way back into the team. All, not the forgotten man of Irish rugby, but certainly things moved ahead last year and Larmer was left behind because of his injury troubles. And his Earl's ahead of both of them. Yes. That actually, if if James Lowe was out, it's not even a conversation about Balakoon. It's like Earlsy straight in. Yeah. So, like, are you? So, if James Lowe's out, are you picking? James Lowe is out, right? So yeah. So, are are you picking? Uh, Conway, Earls, you're picking Earls and Conway. Conway and Keenan, and who's yeah. who's the other one? I'm picking Balakoon. That's what I want to see. Like, if you, yeah, if you, like, if you go like, back to if you go back to the end of last year, is it like it's Earls and Lowe and uh, and Keenan. So Conway's not in that uh, back three in the Six Nations. Yeah. Um, so, like, is that is that the, the pecking order then immediately with with Conway essentially being behind? Or else, but I suppose you're going for the other wing then at that point. Um, I think I think I could see a, a Balakoon, Keenan, Earls back three. Uh, I don't think Conway's getting dropped, is he? Like he was brilliant in the November internationals. Yeah, I don't, like at the same time, there has to be some sort of window for these guys to state their claim. And I mean, is this is it getting dropped or is it just not making the, the starting team when, when Andy Farrell goes to actually um, to, to pick his team? I think that there's just an opening there because of the quality that Balakoon has and I think because of the the dynamic of Sexton's age I think number 10 as well has to be one that they, they have to take a look at as well over the, over the course of these games and, and in a game that's not Italy and then the pack is is it, probably going to pick itself The Italian game is becoming more and more useless in in terms of assessing how well somebody will deal with the whole thing it's, it's about like oh I'm, I'm gonna I mean you don't even get to meet the president anymore Maybe maybe now that the restrictions are over, will he be shaking hands? I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to see what happens. But it's about the pomp and circumstance of the Six Nations as opposed to actually uh, playing an international quality rugby match at the moment. Um, Aina says, Larkham scored a winning drop goal in the World Cup final has over 100 caps for the Wallabies. He was one of the best players in the world for five or six years. Surely an asset to Healy, Carberry and Munster. Yeah, I think he's coming for criticism the same way Van Gran is coming for criticism that um, that era is coming to an end and people hadn't seen the uh, work that they were doing come to fruition then they win at the weekend and everything comes off and it's like oh they were doing this all along so uh, and Owen says Cantona was brilliant I remember as a 12 year old at the moment there was a lot of missiles being thrown at players would you be surprised if it happened again I'd be very surprised if it happened again because the players seem to um, be conditioned to behave that if if something comes from the crowd they're immediately reporting it to the referees as they should be an interesting story in the papers about how um, the cops are saying the uh, it's uh, increased cocaine use which is causing the uh, fueling the fan violence at games um, I was I don't know well, it's interesting to see if um, it may, I'm, I've no doubt that it's a, a factor but uh, it, all of these things are always multifactorial look like 
bad policing outside Allen Road at the weekend. There's pictures of Newcastle fans at the game. Um, and a bit of a crush there too. So anyway, it's uh, 8.34 this morning. If you want to get in touch, we'd love to hear from you. 87 180 is the WhatsApp number. We're going to bring you through the papers next. And Liam McCourt and Tom Parsons will also join us a little bit later on. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The football pod on OTB Sports. I remember having the argument with Jack before and kind of going, Jack, if this shit doesn't work, you're going to put me back out in season. Don't be whipping, don't whip the big donkey out of full fire. <laughs> Get the hop on everyone else and hear the football pod first on the OTB Sports app every Tuesday. I tell you, we were angry after that game. Dublin came back, I remember, in 2015. It was, we're putting this right. For the latest on GAA, rugby, football and much more, download the OTB Sports app, turn on push notifications and hear it here first. With prices from only €289 for fully comprehensive car insurance, everyone's making the jump to getsetgo.ie. New business policies only. Prices subject to minimum premiums. C's and C's apply. MCL Insurance Services Limited Trading is getsetgo.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? After a game in the Premier League on a Saturday night, we had a few drinks, yeah. We were usually off on the Sunday. Like, that's why, like, I have these huge arguments with my dad. Because the GA go on massive drinking bans. Look, my dad is involved with Kilmoyley. They won the Munster Club Championship last week. And I said to him, like, leave them enjoy themselves for, you know, 24 hours. So maybe I believe in the team more than anyone else. I do believe that we have what it takes to finish top of the group. And that's what my ambition is. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts. And download the OTB Sports app. OTB. AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Right, yeah, 836 this morning. If you want to get in touch, 087 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. We can bring you through the sports pages. We'll start with otbsports.com. It was a minor miracle that came so close. That's uh, Connacht struggles talking from Monday Night Rugby last night. Uh, several reported dead in stadium stampede for Cameroon AFCON tie. Owen Farrell injury opens the England door for George Ford. Uh, Johnny May is injured as well. Hakim Ziyech is a completely different player because of Thomas Tuchel, says Pat Nevin. A pie to Ziyech from Pat Nevin last night and Ranieri sacked. Not very surprising that Claudio Ranieri has been sacked. It uh, looked like that was um, a bit of a shot to nothing by Watford, but we bring you through the back page headlines. The um, Daily Mirror tab of the morning to you. Nip and Rook. Romeo's constant pinch attacks and Grealish made City Man lose his cool and confront rival in tunnel. Uh, what do you think of this? Jack Grealish confronting Oriel Romeo in the tunnel. Stop pinching me, uh, Oriel, he said. Uh, like, it's, uh, I mean, f- fair game, isn't it? I mean, like, the, is there a situation where you want your teammates gathering around as well and having a having a pop-off Oriel for, for, for pinching you and, and twisting your skin and all that sort of stuff? The good, good description on the back of the mirror this morning of the instance. Yeah, the dirty trick started from the kickoff. Where he's pinching his nipple, basically. Yeah, I think I think so. It's it's something we've seen in GEA quite a bit, isn't it? Oh, it's a, yeah. I mean, it's. I think fair play to Jack Grealish fighting back. Yeah, you should punch him. Like uh, take the take the three game ban for the punch to the jaw. No one's going to do that again. You just don't do don't kung fu kick him, basically. Yeah. Um, I presume it's uh, relatively not. Like I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sure that Jack Grealish and a lot of those flair players are. Uh, are experiencing that quite a bit that we don't actually see and uh, Oriel Romeo I'd say is possibly a, a, a master in the in the art of it Lampard's in the frame at Watford is the story there Newcastle to be centre of global empire uh, Martin Ziegler and Owen Slot in the London Times are saying that Saudi Arabia will use their public investment fund uh, to build an empire in the same way that Manchester City have done the Manchester City owners have done so a bunch of clubs around the world a bunch of different sports as well and they obviously link this to the golf competition the DP World Tour, the rebranded European Tour, um, are actually taking part in the uh, Saudi International and um, the Public Investment Fund, which owns Newcastle, which is really Saudi Arabia, are also sponsoring the Saudi International Golf Tournament. So there's no there's no amb- amb- ambiguity. Saudi Arabia are using sport to uh, gain soft power on the global stage and the golfers the field in Jeddah is expected to include players such as Tommy Fleetwood, Sergio Garcia, Ian Poulter and Lee Westwood is what it says on the back of the London Times this morning. Some of the Irish golfers obviously go into that as well. Piers Morgan uncensored. Who cares? Uh, screen. Scared refs chicken out in all 49 monitor checks this season. So when you get summoned over to the monitor you do what VAR tells you. 
And it's sort of saying, this is a horror show. Or is it you know, not just that, like, VAR is doing the thing it's supposed to do? Is that... Well, it's not. I mean, like, the, the, the screen should be... Should, should, like, I mean, you got it wrong. You can just go and have another look. Like, and so every time he goes, you're right, I got it wrong. Thanks a million. That's yeah. the whole point of it. So it should. No, but the, the, the whole point, you would, you would think that the whole point is that he can make his own mind up. The, the, the whole point should not necessarily be. Like, I think, I think you should be able to use the screen for right and for wrong. You really know at this point that if you're going over to the screen, you've got it wrong. Yeah. And you got it wrong, it's fine. It's okay to make mistakes. So I, I, I accept that completely. But uh, I, I just think that maybe the. What did they say? 27 times it's been used this season? 47. 47. Should it have been used a little bit more maybe earlier in the season? Are you just getting into the swing of using the screen a bit more now? Um, I don't know. O'Connor, no welfare issues. We talked about this a little bit earlier on. Dilly ding, dilly gone. Maybe that's how of the morning, I'm not sure. Diego and Frank in running after Watford axe Ranieri. So they're saying um, Diego Martinez and Frank Lampard are the favourites. No mention here yet of uh, Roy Hodgson. You're saying Roy Hodgson's all over the place being linked with it. So we'll see about that. Um, the Irish Times has uh, Owen Doyle saying the referee ruined the game at the end last week and they also have a story that Gordon Darcy has joined the Wexford Hurling backroom staff so it's going to be Billy Walsh and Gordon Darcy in the backroom staff for that uh, there's a few other headlines there that haven't done the unknown Covid concerns still very real says tip boss is David Power and uh, snowboarder Seamus O'Connor was yesterday named as part of a six strong Ireland team for the Winter Olympics we'll do more on that a little bit later and Keith Rickens has been out doing media he says this isn't the job because he doesn't get effing paid for it he was joking obviously but Rickens rewards I don't get a brass penny for what I do we do it for the love of it so uh, he's coming out and making you fall in love with the Cork footballers which is a very difficult thing to do well, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure why you would say that. Well, you've always patronised them, so you love you love seeing Cork because they never beat you. So it's all good for you. John Duncan, good morning to you. Jaron Owen, how are you doing? Very well. Uh, just breaking news around a few things, folks. Uh, now eight people at least reported uh, to be dead and 38 injured, seven seriously following that tragedy, that crush outside the Africa Cup of Nations match in Cameroon yesterday. So there was a... A rush on the gates before the game against Comoros at the Paul Bia Stadium in the capital, Uande. One child among the dead, according to an AFP report. So, very, very sad news. It's got a capacity of 60,000, the stadium, but due to COVID-19 restrictions, it was not supposed to be more than 80% full. So, the game went ahead. A 2-1 win for Cameroon. Not that that's important now. Um, but yeah, awful, awful news from... Uh, from Africa for the Cup of Nations and hopefully there'll be a thorough investigation to what happened to people losing their lives going to a football match. Um, that news you have, uh, just moving away from that, uh, Roy Hodgson has got the job apparently, according to The Athletic. He'll take training this afternoon with Ray Lewington to assist the 74-year-old. So Roy, the Red Adair uh, for Watford to come in and, and sort it out as he would have done with Fulham and Crystal Palace got four seasons out of Crystal Palace and kept them in the Premier League for that period of time so if you believe the Athletic he's got the gig really Good. but the football's terrible the Roy Hodgson football experience is awful um, I know and it'll be interesting to hear what Damien Delaney has to say uh, like they stayed up in the Premier League that was what you're supposed to do but it's terrible to watch did Watford not have kind of vague ambitions of playing good quality football uh, Watford deserved to go down Watford the most unstable club I think I've ever seen in football like 14 managers in 10 years since the Pozzo family took over I know Ranieri didn't have a great run he lost what 8 in the last 9 but he's only been there for 14 games this is a guy who's won the Premier League title and look at the way like Burnley well, I don't know if Sean Dyche will lose his job if Burnley go down but Sean Dyche has had a good run of, of going down and then coming back up and there's a degree of consistency about what Burnley is and the identity there's no identity to what Watford do like I've been doing the lineups every single week and it's a, a, a changing cast of characters every single week and also what, what, what must the players think going well well there's Roy but he'll be gone this summer yeah what's going to happen to me they're only going to think about themselves and uh, it's a mess I think to suggest that Watford have uh, any sort of identity or style is, is probably a bit wide of the mark isn't it that like it's that they'll take whatever gets them Premier League football next season the Athletic are saying he's taking charge of training this afternoon it's a done deal right yeah it's it's a long way from Graham Taylor and Elton John, you know, when they were very much there for the long the long haul, and uh, and there was a club that you know, you John Barnes there oh. and Luther Blissett, and what they reached an FA Cup final, they were second in the league, but uh, yeah, uh, some of the owners are, I don't think they're great for 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 football, you know. Uh, what else is going on? Rafa Nadal into the semi-finals of the Australian Open. 
uh, into a semi-final of a Grand Slam for a 36th time. So five set win over Denis uh, Shapovalov of Canada at the Australian Open. So he's now going to take on Matteo Berrettini or Gael Monfils. And also today we've had Barbara Krajcikova lose to Madison Keys in straight sets. So Keys, the American, into the semi-finals. Ash Barty on court at the moment against uh, Jessica Pagula. Dan Royal hosts racing this afternoon, folks. Ten past one. You're speaking about Seamus O'Connor there. You can check out the podcast of the chat I have with him. And the very entertaining Bubba Newby and Tess Arbay out of their Winter Olympics uh, journey to Beijing. Uh, I don't know about you, folks. I was thinking to myself... This is obviously, we all love, we all like utterly love what we do and we talk about this every day and we love sport, but, and it's very much a vocational thing, I think, for all of us. But how much sport do we watch outside of, of working hours? Because on Sunday morning, I got up at eight o'clock and I watched Abu Dhabi until about one. Then I went for a one hour brisk walk up a hill and got the papers and I came back and I watched Palace Liverpool. Then I watched Chelsea Spurs and then straight into, as I read some of the papers and got something to eat as well, which was kind of a sidebar into the American Express and eventually that finished at half 12 in the morning and they went to sleep. Now, don't do this every single weekend, but... You missed the NFL. You could have flicked on the NFL. Well, there you go. At five in the morning. <laughs> you know, so how much is enough? You know, how much is too much? But uh, it's you really could just... It never sleeps. I think Christmas Eve may be the only day when, when sport sleeps, but it, it, there's a lot going on and uh, you can really get into it. I was isolating on Christmas Day and was very grateful for the shitty Cleveland Browns versus I can't even remember who they were playing to uh, numb some of the pain. But um, yeah, and the NBA is on Christmas Day too, isn't it? Mm. But like, what's, uh, I'm interested here, John, and what, what's the meal plan like? I mean, you're saying you're trying to eat as a sidebar. Like, are you, are you, are you meal prepping the day before to ensure that you're not missing too much of the action or how does this work? A little bit of that. Um, I'm very much on a... Um, a hardcore diet at the moment so like there's no there's no like pizza deliveries or no delivery like no no there's no delivery until Easter Sunday until I rise again um, everything is very much like extreme extreme tough diet and are you happy in the, in these moments of like watching all the sport on a Sunday and well it, it, it's, it's a funny one because you're half working so you know you're like, be doing stats you'd be, you'd, be, you'd be analysing the game more so than watching it and golf, obviously, with virtual insanity, we're going to make it an amazing year. It'll be one of the greatest years of all time. Um, you are analysing certain things. So, like, you'd be watching vir- you'd be watching the American Express, but you'd also be reading interviews from the day before, the day before that, and whatever. And it's a privilege to do it. But sometimes, when, when, you, when you're watching it, when you have to be on it, versus, like going to a match and doing a match report, versus just watching it passively and enjoying it, there is a little bit of a difference between the two. Yeah, I think that's I think that's fair. There is, like there is, I mean, like being a if you weren't a golf fan, you could save yourself a lot of time. You could. Now I don't do this every single weekend, folks, just to uh, reassure everybody that I do have somewhat of a life. But um, it's also the fact that the uh, Middle Eastern swing of the European Tour or the DP uh, is full generally of interesting golfers because yeah. of the appearance money, and so it's rare enough that there would be good stuff on that early. Yeah. On the weekend mornings. And, and interesting stories from an Irish perspective. Rory McIlroy with his classic Rory McIlroy Sunday round um, of brilliance and, and ordinary. And then Shane Lowry as well. So, yeah. So, is there anything you're going to do to wean yourself off? Or is this just it? That's, no, that's this, it. This is it. We've got Cheltenham coming up now in six weeks. So, there's, 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 you know, you could really go down a rabbit hole of, of, of Cheltenham form and, and, and watch every single video back from last September, October. So, it could, it could be quite... Um, it could be quite an industrial uh, run, but like the, we're going to come up fair and it'll be a magnificent uh, situation. I just complete. I'm like, I don't know, one complete waffle here now. I'm just completely talking ramble, rambling nonsense. <laughs> I don't know, John. I think we're all uh, we're all lucky to to that you can watch the sport for us and inform us on, on everything that we've missed. Uh, no, we, we know, and you know, I'm sure you watch the McGrath Cup. You probably watch the replay. It's the only thing I watched the weekend. Yeah, I mean, I found myself watching some of the O'Byrne Cup final, going, "What? What's wrong with my life?" And yet, also being like, "Oh, they picked a good team here. This is, you know, this is like, this is relatively exciting." And they're not that good. I don't think the Dubs are that good this year at the moment. I, I would venture that there is. I mean, look, it's GA is probably separate to, to this, but I'd say maybe when it comes to the to football, I'd say a lot of Premier League teams and people watch it a good section of the pre-season games and may actually not watch some of the late season Premier League games because of the fact that it's like right okay we're only a couple of weeks away from the season give me something well it's like your fantasy football team right at the start of the year you feel like this is going to be good I'm going to follow this every week mm. and then after a period of time you realise that you're like mediocre it, I mean I can see speak why, for yourself I can see why teams would get into um, or fans get into the pre-season because the new signings and the kids we don't know how good they're going to be Yeah, it's the eternal it's the men in blacking of our 
sports experience that we all suffer from, it's like, well, it's going to be our year. Yeah. And then, you know, cruel, is that actual good? reality yeah. kicks in and you're like, oh, why do I do this to myself? And then you take your break and then it starts again. Is that a pop culture reference, Man in Black? <laughs> I never saw it. That's why I'm kind of... Just, Are you, uh, really? Okay. I never saw it. No, they, I, have I, a, they have a device that makes you forget everything. You just press the button and you forget everything. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. That was, um, was it Tommy Lee Jones? Or was it? That's it. Will Smith. I never saw it. I, I know, we all know the theme tune. <laughs> never saw it. So, Owen, oh, you win the, you actually yeah, is win this, the, Is this my moment to you, order this, over you, John? This, this is to win the pop culture moment of our OTBM slot, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. It feels, feels weird to be on this side of the fence. Uh, it's 8.50 this morning. If you want to get in touch with us, 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. John, I'm surprised that you haven't resigned to go and start working for Racing TV or whoever it was <laughs> at the weekend. <laughs> Off tube in a, a tinny room like this, calling Shiskin versus Energamine. Unbelievable stuff. Ah, that's very nice of you. Um, it's better than having a 30 runner five for a long sprint. Well, that's next, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Make this a regular thing on Saturday. But it, with all these things, um, don't go too soon. Don't, don't boil over halfway through, uh, I think was the first thing I, I, I said to myself. And the second thing I said to myself, make sure you get it right. Luckily, it was, a, it was always going to be a match, wasn't it, between the two. And, uh, and thankfully... It well, I don't, know if, I don't know if you saw the race. This is one of the other sporting highlights of the weekend. We had, like, uh, as John says, Ireland versus England. And it looks for all the world that we're going to have a trap-to-line victory. And, uh, and then all of a sudden there's a sensational end... And you managed to just call it right at the specific moment that it happened. Yeah, look, luckily, watching the thing for so many years, um, and uh, you know, I actually watched the night before. I watched about five or six runnings of that race um, at Ascot, that specific race, to get the sense of the of the you know the contours of the course and the fences and how many had to be jumped and all that kind of thing. And once all, all that is in there, then it's just a case of just getting it all out there. So luckily, it luckily it came off, and uh, everybody was very nice to to post their comments afterwards, including yourself, Jerry. So Enjoyable. You. Oh, very much so, yeah. Look, um, I was... You feel alive. There was, there was a funny... There was a, there was a research I was doing for the Saturday panel on a half-pipe snowboarding and these guys. And I've never seen this stuff before, but Seamus O'Connor does. And uh, I think this guy, guy's name is Sean White. And the stuff they're doing is off the scale. It's off the scale. And I'll be watching this now, the Winter Olympics, a complete bandwagoner. But it was like comments on the YouTube and... Uh, one part goes, that, that, that guy, Sean White, devoured the pressure. And I just thought, I never heard that phrase before, devour the pressure. And that was my whole mindset going into the commentary. Right. Interesting. Who knows where this is going to go. John, good <laughs> Sorry, stuff. Lads, cheers. Yeah, it's uh, John Duggan with us. You can hear more, of course, on Saturday afternoon on Off the Ball on News Talk. It is 8.52 this morning. Listening to Raj talk about competitiveness or lack of the URC, it doesn't really sound like a competition he wants to coach in, regardless of the team, says Asnier is 32. Mike, have I, have I butchered the, the handle there? I'm not sure. And uh, Shane says, any league games being live streamed again this year? I don't know what the crack is. I presume it's back to the original TV deals and so those games won't be streamed. It's like show up or watch the game that's available on telly or that's it. I don't know, actually. I know TG Cahar have like three games on, on Sunday anyway, one deferred, two live. OK, well, we look into that. We can, we can do some research for you. Uh, Bellator returns to Dublin's Three Arena on Friday, February the 25th. It features a massive domestic featherweight bout as fourth-ranked Liam McCourt takes on fifth-ranked Sinead Kavanagh. And I'm delighted to say Liam McCourt is with us this morning. Leah, how are you getting on? I'm doing good. How are you? Yeah, good. I just realised today is the 25th of January, so we're exactly a month out from the 25th of February. What's the next four weeks like for you in terms of making sure that you're as strong as you possibly can be while uh, safely in under the, under the weight? What's that like? Yeah, just continuing to, you know, implement my fight camp, um, like I've been doing the last kind of six weeks, um, and just training hard, pushing myself hard, and, and recovering good, and, and making sure I really peak on fight week. In terms of the specific challenge that Sinead uh, is going to pose for you on the night itself, what are you doing in terms of... Uh, sparring, like, is there something specific that she has in her armory that you're working on at the moment? Yeah, obviously she needs a, a big power puncher and she's got knockout power and she's um, her kind of movement and boxing skill, you know, that's her a, a big asset of her, so I've been working just kind of, I've got, got a few different sparring partners in, just kind of imitating that and um, just treat it as, as hard as I can. I'm really just working on my, on my game more so than focusing on my opponents. What are you working on then? What 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 do you want to bring on the night? 
Um, I just want to show my kind of uh, just continue to kind of bring out in the cage what I do in the gym. You know, it's you know a lot of people always say to me, you only you, when you fight, you only show like five percent of what you can do, and I think you know with every fight, it's just getting that bit more comfortable in the cage to kind of like let loose and let your kind of different skill sets out um, and you know we, we have to kind of learn on the job it's not like we've had been able to fight a hundred amateur fights um, you know MMA is so new so every time you step in the cage you, you kind of show a new, a new side to yourself which is really exciting as well and that's what you know, really motivates me When people say that you only show 5% of yourself in the cage are, are they right when they say that do you think? Um, I think I think so. I think um, it's, it's very different, obviously, performing and bringing out everything you can do on fight night compared to when you're in training. But the more you do that, the more you kind of uh, can feel comfortable in, in the cage and in those scenarios and you know, in, in the big arenas to, to kind of just relax and, and, and realise like you, you're there to fight, but you do do it every single day in the gym so and not be too overwhelmed by this, the kind of occasion. So you see it as a as a form of expression as much as, uh, uh, like, I guess, trying to just get the win? Sorry? Do, do you see it as a form of expression as trying to just get the win? Like, obviously, like, my, my, my all that's in my head ever is winning. But again, you want to put on a good performance. You want to show that you're at that kind of level to be, you know, be challenging for a title shot. And um, I think it's important to, to show a good account of yourself as well as winning, yeah. It's rare enough that we would see uh, an all Irish encounter in Ireland um, in front of a full house. So, like, what what part of your thinking is is the build up, the fact that this is going to be such an explosive event uh, for Irish MMA? D- do you think about that at all? Are you are you trying to feed off that? Do you try and keep it at bay? What what's that like? Uh, like whatever I was asked asked about the fight you know it was just immediately i was like like that this fight would have to happen in dublin it wouldn't happen anywhere else and we're kind of at that stage in our careers you know um it's kind of like perfect timing and it, it has to happen in three arenas so i i was nothing about excited because if i was a fan i would want to watch this fight you know striker versus grappler and we're both from ireland and you know, we train hard we fight hard and leave it all in the cage so I just thought it's going to be you know, a great night. How well do you know Sinead? Yeah, I know her really well. You know, I've um, she's helped me out in the camps a camp years ago, coming over to help me spar, and I've done her corner before in Bellator. And like, it's it's never personal for me fighting. It's it's about you know myself and um, I don't know. It's about you know you know my career, and it's the same for Sinead. You know, we'll go and fight our hearts out, and then we'll probably have a drink after. So. That's just who we are. We're quite honest. And just you know, work hard, fight hard, and that's there's no kind of mess or anything around it. There's a psychological switch that you you need to flip. Then at some point on the night where you go from being this is somebody who I'm friendly with, I've helped in the past, who's helped me, who I know pretty well, to I actually now need to win this fight by whatever means legally possible. How do you do that? How how does that come about, Leah? What do you do? I I. Uh, on fight day, I think the whole progress of, you know, the whole, like in a fight camp, you're training your mental side even more so than the physical side. So you're preparing yourself to step in the cage and preparing yourself for all those emotions on fight day, the ups and the downs of fight week and, you know, the weight cut and, and warming up and, and walking out to the, to the three arena. And we've, we've both done it before in the three arena. So it's not like it's anything new to us. Um, and I know as soon as the bell goes, we'll both be fighting to win. So it's not, I kind of always go into this kind of zone on fight day that, you know, I don't, don't like to talk much, just like to, the, the, I, I feel most comfortable warming up on fight day. I love being in the arena in the atmosphere, even though you've got a million emotions, this is where I feel most calm. Right, that that's a bit mad, isn't it? That actually, it, it feels like an arrival somewhere comfortable, even though the rest of the world would probably be very uncomfortable with what they're about to do. Yeah, I know. It's such a weird, it's so hard to describe. You know, I remember before I had like three arena, I was I was in my hotel room, like right beside the three arena and I and I was watching people walking in to watch me fight. And I was like, Why can't I be one of those people that don't why do I have to walk in and fight? Like I was like going to the guys, right, can we get a fight? Right, can, can, I wanna I wanna run away. Like 
your your head just like goes in a million places and you're thinking I could drive to Dublin airport and not have to do this <laughs> so like so much goes on in your head it's crazy but you always you know come back to that I'm going and I'm going to fight and it's just the it's so addictive that feeling that all the 10 million emotions of, of fight day and then when you're actually in the ring it's uh, in the in the cage itself and the the fight starts what are your emotions like at that point then it's everything's gone everything's away it's just that's the that's the bit that you work so hard for to kind of capitalize on, on, on different situations or scenarios or whatever happens and and that's every, everything goes away then it's just fighting it's just what you love to do and look, I, I, you know, it's a stupid question, but is that enjoyable, that bit in the fight when you're actually, because you're, you're getting punched, you're getting kicked, you're, you know, you're getting grabbed, and yet you're saying that it's, it's what you've been doing all of the hard work for. In, in, a, in a weird way, is that actually enjoyable? I don't know. If, I don't, I can't, it's hard to say enjoyable. It's like when you win, it's the best feeling in the world. And when you put on a good performance, it's, it's you know there's there's nothing in the world that will come with it. But if you if you lose, it's like the worst feeling in the world. So it's that the whole experience is enjoyable, but the fight, it's hard to say that that is. I don't know. It, it's it's weird. It's hard to put in. It's really hard to like kind of communicate it in words. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand exactly what the actual moments in the in the battle are like, and it seems as if you you've got a very clear mind you're leaning back on all the hard work that you've done and all the experience that you've built up but at the same time you're hyper aware yeah it is, it is like you're hyper aware of the situation and and, and the different scenarios and you can you can kind of hear your corner shouting and you kind of n not really so you really have to rely on your own instincts and your own technique and, the, and you know what you've drilled in the gym and your sequences and and that killer instinct and i really find like in the heat of the of battle i i always have that kind of killer instinct in certain moments that that comes out in the cage, um, which is obviously an attribute. It's a good thing. Did you have the killer instinct as a kid? Was it brought out over a period of time or is it something that you've honed over the last couple of years in particular? I don't know. I do I do remember when I, I did judo as a child. I, did, I didn't, me and my sisters, we didn't want to do judo. We didn't want to compete. We, we, we did it like internationally and I wanted the fight to be over fast. So I always would have won really fast because I wanted to, to do it to be over. So um I think that kind of kicks in in, in MMA a wee bit. I want the you know wanted to be in and out fast and clinical and, and have a nice performance, but if not, you know, make it a gritty fight. And so judo was your way into this originally, was it? So I did I did um judo as a child. My dad made me do it and then when I had my daughter Isabella I started training in an MMA gym and the guys have seen I um had a judo background and then I was like training more than the pro fighters and I was working and I had Isabella and they kind of encouraged me to, to, to have a fight yeah and was it an easy enough encouragement were they were they like oh you should do this and like yeah I'm definitely going to do this or was like oh, no 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 I couldn't or could I no, I just I don't it's so weird my whole journey I just kind of like always like jumped before I could fly or whatever the term is I just kind of threw myself into it and probably wasn't ready for it but you obviously have to take big chances and in life and big risks and I always always take the risk and never sit back and, and be comfortable so um, I'm definitely glad I did <laughs> but looking back I'm like why would I have ever gotten the cage of fall back <laughs> and at what point did the penny drop that this was going to be your life for the next five seven ten years that you could actually make a living from this it, it never really that that scenario never really happened I kind of just kept um trying to fight as much as possible and then I turned professional and had a couple of good opportunities and, and signed to Bellator and to kind of through the um the, the you know when I kept winning, kept winning, I was like, okay, right. I kinda of, it kinda of just kinda of happened. I didn't make some big decision that I was gonna do this. It's just I feel like it was real like God it was really God given and kinda of directed different my path in different ways, opened different doors and this was kind of the way he led me to because I used to be a horse rider I wanted to be a show jumper not a fighter <laughs> kind, of, kind of different yeah a wee bit and come here the the uh, the uh, career with Bellator is that mapped out for you are, are you tied to them for a number of fights or is it big fight by big fight when you get to your level how does that work um, I'm just in a contract and I obviously um, 
I've had a couple of different contracts since I've, I've signed with Bellator. I've uh, three fights left in this current contract. And yeah, they look after me so well. And I am so happy. And they've given me so many unbelievable opportunities that I don't know if I you know, would have got, well, definitely wouldn't have got anywhere else. And I feel really blessed to have made the decision to go with them when I did. So this fight is obviously massive because you guys are so close to each other in the rankings. But what would victory mean? What what doors would it open for you in terms of opportunities next? Um, to obviously, I imagine closer towards a title shot. That's my ultimate goal: is to be, um, you know, world champion. I was a world champion as an amateur. It's always been the same goal as a professional. Um, and do you know, I think it would be a big statement if I was able to come away with the win um, because of Sinead's calibre and how, you know, how, how experienced that she is. She's just coming off a title shot as well, so it's, it's, it is a big opportunity. And in in that respect, how well do you feel like you match up with Sinead at the moment? Um, we are pretty... It, it's, our games are so different, you know, but we're, we're both... We both like to finish. We both like to, um, you know, fight. Like we'll, we'll leave everything in there. And I, I don't want to talk too much, but I just, um, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, going back to a couple of things you said there earlier on, you must be pretty happy at this point that you didn't decide to go to Dublin Airport that night of the the three arena in 2020. Yeah. Things worked out pretty well. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness they didn't. <laughs> I was like, someone Google flights. How can I run out of here? <laughs> Like, uh, I, that was that, that was the best night of my life, definitely. You know, um, having that kind of <coughs> opportunity and having Isabella, and my daughter there that night, it, it kind of was was more so about like um, in my part, in, like my, in my life, like that was like such a big, you know, thank goodness I never gave up. I didn't stop fighting, I didn't stop training, and it kind of like a you know, pivotal moment in my life just to believe in myself and, and that um, you just have to keep going, keep fighting. So it was an incredible night. You were the headliner that night. Obviously, the the home crowd essentially was just it was electric for the for the entire thing. I presume then once you eventually do get into the arena, once you once you're backstage and and listening to what's going on out there, that adds a whole other level of adrenaline to your performance as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Especially you know, I remember James Gallagher. He was messaged me being like, "Just do you remember you're going to be on." You know, a, a good bit later, and the walkout's going to be a lot longer, and the time. Diff- and he was ex- saying, you know, like when you're ahead, and things are a bit different rather than just you know going out and fighting, and and all those different bits definitely helped. And um, because there's so much going on around you on fight night, there's so much um, things that could distract you. You have to be so laser like focused, and I have that. I know I have that and no matter what's going on around me I'll be able to focus and just hone in on, on the job at hand and I don't really take in the crowd or anything until the fight's off over because I'm so focused on, on the job I have to do. You have fought a couple of times uh, during the pandemic but how much does uh, what is it the, the 25th of uh, February feel like the, the sort of first fight since 2020 if that makes any sense? Yeah def- I think it's because it's, it's back in Dublin you know it's, mm. it's a love Fight week in Dublin. I love the atmosphere. I love, <clears throat> um, you know, b- being in the, in the three arena and then having all the Irish guys on the card as well. It just feels like uh, coming back home again. You know, obviously I fought in America, then I fought in London. It's just so nice to be back fighting in Dublin. It's my favorite place in the world. Everybody always asks, like, do you want to fight here or there? And I'm like, no. I, and I never take for granted the opportunity that I have when, when I get to fight in Dublin on, on Bellator because I know looking back, it's, it's um, I'm very, very fortunate to be able to have this experience, you know, in Dublin. And can I just ask, how far did the show jumping thing go, Leah? Sorry. How how far did the show jumping uh, career go? Or <laughs> well, I was, I did actually did everything. I did um, cross country dressage. I would have like rode people's show ponies for them. And then what actually happened was like I got an allergy towards horses, so like anytime <laughs> I went up. The- Horses, I my face came out in like hives and lumps, and I did it for. I kept trying to do it for a couple of years. I just had to I had to stop, had to give up. So I think that was like God's way of pushing me into into MMA, <laughs> not 
No, should I jump in? <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, one hell of a turnaround. I, I presume that there is that, that there's no sort of uh, common ground between show jumping and uh, and mixed martial arts, or, or am I wrong? Is there is there something that you that there, you've taken away? There definitely is. It's definitely yeah. that. Horse riding is a little bit more scary because you're not in control of the horse. You're not in control of what what might happen. It's, and it's a little bit more of the unknown. Do you know, whereas obviously you're fighting, you put yourself just to blame if, if it goes wrong. But um, definitely you have to have courage to be, a, you know, to, to ride a horse station jumper. And I always, everybody always used to get me to ride the mad horses, the crazy ones, because I kind of just got on with it. But I do I definitely take some aspects away and then how I even trained my horses, you know, I used to write out my schedules about how I was going to train them and, or like what days, what training and then I do that now in MMA. So there's, there's some similarities. <laughs> Certainly, the adrenaline rush seems to be fairly similar. Uh, Leah, I've, I've one last question. You, you mentioned God a couple of times there, and I know on your Twitter bio you have saved by grace through faith. Faith is obviously important to you. You feel like it, this is um, an important part of your life. Um. Yeah. Like. Yeah. It's, it, I don't think I don't. I never say I'm, I'm a religious or it's faith. It's like you know I believe in God. I believe in the Bible, and that's where that what gets me through. You know my fight camps. My all the hard things that, that kind of is thrown at you. You know, I always say that um, fighting brings out the best in me it, or it drives me to be the best physically, mentally, spiritually. And definitely I, um, even, you know, people have said, you know, on, on fight night when you're walking out, there's a real presence in the room. And I always, always know that, you know, God, God is there. He's with me. And I always say, I'll do whatever I can do to win. But it, if it's in his will, I'll win. And if not, it's not his will. So something better will come along. I know a lot of fighters are particularly religious. Katie Taylor, obviously, is is, um, is someone who has publicly spoken about her Christianity in the past. Is there something about the fight game you think that um, that lends itself to uh, people expressing their faith in in public like this? I, I think uh, Tyson Fury, similarly, is um, is somebody who wears his his uh, faith openly as well. Um, I, I definitely think we have a lot of experiences and go through a lot of things that a normal person wouldn't go through. And it's very hard to do that on your own. It's very hard to, to have that kind of strength and um, mentally and physically without really just being honest to me. And like, you know, why we're here is, is there's a purpose for everybody being here. There's a purpose for us having these opportunities, you know, having these platforms. And, and I think it becomes more apparent when you're put into these scenarios are kind of not not normal, you know, and, and that that kind of brings you closer. So it's definitely to God and your own personal relationship. And, and if you don't honor him, you don't give him back the, the, the glory, then then what's the point? Do you know what I mean? It just definitely feel like um yeah, you, you definitely do see it in fighting and I, I do think it's something to do with it. It's just such an unnatural thing that we're doing and kind of journey and path that we're on. Was this always part of your life or is this something that kind of goes hand in hand with your discovery of MMA as something that you wanted to do professionally? Um, no, I, my, my family have always went to church. We've always been believers and always it's it's just definitely strengthened and, and got stronger. My relationships got stronger through my career and a lot of things that have happened in my life. Well, it's just uh, it, again, you know, it's something that we don't get to talk about uh, a lot with people. But it always it fascinates me that so many fighters um, talk about their faith, particularly in the build-up to fights, and it's obviously something that you you lean on in the build-up and that you feel you need. Yeah, definitely, and definitely, everybody everybody knows Fight Week that I have my my hill songs and my my worship music on, and they're like they get like PTSD in my weight cuts because I've always got like <laughs> my my music on and they people who aren't Christians or my my team and all they all it's like it's like a it's like a running joke but um it's definitely you know it's definitely the the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing is you know kind of his path and his plan that he has me on. Well, Leah, we wish you the very best with the next four weeks in preparation and with the weight cuts and uh, best of luck on fight night as well. Thanks a million for making the time for us this morning. Thank you. Bye. It's uh, Liam McCourt there. Obviously, um, it's been pinned as the biggest all-Irish MMA fight of all time. Certainly, that's what the uh, promotion is telling you. It's up against uh, Sinead Kavanagh on Friday, February the 25th, so 30 days away. Um, 
it's a tricky old game to fight game isn't it oh, absolutely and um, like uh, fighting tooth and nail to, to, to get up to that level um, and even then to, to, to try and maintain that level over what has been uh, a desperately tough two years where their biggest earnings are coming from the biggest sellout events which just have not existed for, for 24 months so it's been extremely tough a tough sport made tougher OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette Good morning start with Gillette put your best face forward with their new and improved razors we're going to speak with Tom Parsons the Chief Executive of the Gaelic Players Association next OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio Ireland's first and only sports radio station Who knew that we had this much to talk about? Keep up to date with the latest WSL action and the biggest interviews What is it like refereeing Karen Duggan on a pitch? We've heard many things Very quiet, easy day Subscribe to the Koi Gig podcast stream on the OTB Sports app now With prices from only €289 for fully comprehensive car insurance Everyone's making the jump to getsetgo.ie. New business policies only. Prices subject to minimum premiums. Season C and C supply. MCL Insurance Services Limited Trading is getsetgo.ie. Is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. 15 minutes past nine this morning. I'm delighted to say Tom Parsons of the Gaelic Players Association is with us. Tom, good morning. Jay, how are you getting on? Hi, Jar. Hi, Owen. How are you guys? Um, we're, we're back to talking about uh, championship structures for our sins. We must have been very, very bad in a former life to be still talking about this. But um, at the moment, it looks like there is a very strong momentum behind the Green proposal, um, which Central Council voted on at the weekend. And now we expect, I would say, that um, a majority of people will uh, get behind at Congress. Is that your understanding, that Green will appear and will have the support of enough people to get through this time? Yeah, I, I think there's still a lot of a lot of work to do. I suppose there was two proposals on offer, green and red, and both met the criteria for players of enhancing the development for squads, change a pathway to success, and were far better than the status quo. And it's positive that this time round, there's it seems to be a little bit more alignment between players and administrators and county boards. So I think it is a really good chance, and it's, I suppose it's very positive, Jar that we've turned around in four months since Special Congress a motion or a structure that, that that has got, you know, nearly unanimous support from players. But there's still a lot of work to be done when once, you know, delegates and county board members do a deep dive into this structure. So there's a, there's a bit of work to be done yet. Is it as much a, a unanimous vote to get away from the status quo as much as anything else, Tom? Yeah, like the debate now really is, is green versus the, the status quo. And like... Green, it, it got overwhelming support from the players, you know, and I suppose the players didn't have this option in, in October. Uh, you know, if, if it was an option in October, it would have gathered a lot of, a lot of support. And like, what are we up against them at, at the minute when you look at the status quo? At the minute, you play the National League as you prep for championship. You play the Provincial Championship. And in most cases, when you look at it, 28 teams uh, are knocked out. And fundamentally, that's it. The oxygen is gone and you limp into the qualifiers. Versus, you know, this is a much more competitive um, competition, you know. So, like, even to just give a little bit of context on on, on Green, because we all, you know, I think Proposal B captured our hearts and, and imagination because it flipped the season on the head. Um, but I firmly believe, first and foremost, that Proposal B in October finally got home the message of the importance of the leagues, the importance of seeding and tiers, and above all, the importance of competitive games for every team. And I suppose, where did this green proposal come from? Um, like Sean Kelly, uh, the ex-president, outlined this years ago. So the likes of Jim McGuinness, Dara Kaneda, a lot of significant GA people have endorsed this plan publicly. And what it does is the leagues now really di- dictate the All-Ireland series because all the Division One and Two teams essentially, essentially qualify for Sam Maguire. And then the Division Three and Four teams qualify for the Italian Cup and the provincials then which is a quick knockout is really a mechanism for a division three or four team to get into Sam Maguire so it's a wild card chance for division three and four team and then the All-Ireland series which is group stages of four at the start of the season um, is tried and tested it's used by most major competitions around the world so I suppose from a player's point of view finally the, the you know there's a link between the league and the All-Ireland series um, and this is this is a really strong proposal for players. 
Uh, were you surprised that the support from the players was so overwhelming in favour of green versus red, given that red looked much closer to the proposal B option? Yeah, like initially, initially, you know, I, I obviously was thinking, let's let's edit proposal B, get it out on the table, and and that has to be the runner for players. And I suppose they they needed to alter proposal B to get it over the line to satisfy some of the Division One counties to make a, a link for the provincials and awarding points. And I think that compromise in proposal B just weakened it for players. Like so, for example, you know, it nearly half the number of, of of trophies available for players throughout the year because you dropped those league titles, and that was really important for players because I suppose in the green proposal when they were looking at it, there's the opportunity to win ten trophies, and we know that if you win a league competition or you you win a provincial, uh, it gives a, a team oxygen and develops teams. So I definitely think dropping the um, the league titles. Um, put players off. And I suppose when you look at any league around the world, from Premier Leagues to NBAs to NFLs, you, you never really have a you know, like a Premier League 1A versus Premier League 1B. You have you have league winners and league titles. And then I think a lot of players, when they did a deep dive into it, were spooked with provincials being awarded two points. And they were they were going through the scenario of Dublin and Kerry and having two points on the board before they go into the league and how do we catch them and so so I think players you know when you looked at the the surveys and we did focus groups and we talked to reps and captains they could get their head around the green proposal they could understand it and they looked at it in black and white and said okay well this enhances our league because it becomes more exciting it adds an extra level of importance because it's linked to the All-Ireland series and now the All-Ireland series which is group group teams uh, with teams playing at their own level, the Tal Team Cup winners still get guaranteed entrance to Sam Maguire the following year. So, so it ticked an awful lot, lot of boxes. So Green didn't flip the season on its head and, I suppose, capture the imagination of people uh, like Proposal B did. But from the principal's point of view, it did everything else from players. And when players looked at it, uh, and it took a while, once players actually looked at the videos, um, you know, slowly there was more momentum growing and growing and growing towards proposal, proposal green. What killed uh, proposal B? Well, many different things killed proposal B. My fundamental belief is that the provincial councils and their soft power uh, off off Broadway killed it because they didn't want it to happen and, and they made sure that um, it wasn't going to go ahead. Uh, but also, what the the arguments they put in were the sixth place team in Division One, and then. Yeah. Um, the other stuff was was kind of um, it, it was kind of an amalgamation of of, uh, of different. They, they fought the war on many fronts. I think it's fair to say. I, for for me, the one strength of it was that it was very clear in terms of these games result in this. We're kind of left with a bit of a hodgepodge with the green proposal, where the provincial championships are going to be in the middle of the season, um, and I I kind of still don't fully understand what the point of them are in the long run. Mm. Are, are we in danger of, of having a a bit of a dog's dinner? Yeah, no. I, I, well, I don't think so. I, like, we, there had to be compromise. And you're right, the provincials wanted, you know, their their, their competition to be front and centre. And it's not that players don't like the provincials. Players, players value the provincials. They just didn't want the provincials to be the ultimate link to the All-Ireland series. So, like, in the current structure, if you don't really win a provincial... You're knocked out and you're going through this qualifier route and like so it doesn't serve teams well whereas in this structure i know the provincials are played in the middle of the season as in it's league then it's provincials then it's then it's the group stages um but ultimately the provincial you don't have to win a provincial title to get into the all-ireland series the fundamental championship is in that champions league format when you're going to your groups of four um so you know you could argue we could argue and say well, the core competition is the, the, the four groups of four, the Champions League format. That's, that's number one. The second most important competition is the league. And, and the third most important competition is the provincial. So why aren't they played in that order? But I, I think fundamentally, Jer, the structure philosophy has to be right first. And, and then we can worry about, you know, the time of year that competitions are played at. And the provincials, and if this passes, the provincials have conceded the fact that you know, maybe a Dublin, a Mayo, a Tyrone don't have to win a provincial title to get through to the All-Ireland Series. So they have conceded that. 
And I, I don't know, when I was looking at it, Jar, and talking to a lot of players about it, um, maybe we'll have more diversity of winners between in, in the provincials because, you know, I was even looking at Leash and Dublin last last weekend. Leash really rattled Dublin. I should have beaten Dublin. And and Dublin probably had, you know, maybe um, 60, 70% of their strongest team. Uh, they still had the Brian Fentons, the Kieran Kilkenny's, but Leash really rattled them. So maybe in the provincials, um, we'll see more diversity of winners between the National League and the All-Ireland Series. And it's no harm to have, like, you're going to have a gap. Currently, the gap between the league and the championship is just a void of five weeks and there's nothing. So the, the link now between the league and the championship is is a quick knockout competition. And it's and it's positive. And I do believe that teams who win provincial competitions, like they, they do value that medal. Like it is a valuable competition. They just didn't want it to be the ultimate link to the All-Ireland Series. Okay, so it feels like we're inching towards a good solution. This might not be the good solution, really. It's a staging post along the way. Is that fair? No, like I, I think I think it is. I think it's a good solution. Uh, players like it. Like when you look at it, we're comparing it against the, the status quo, right? So, like, what does it do across the whole season? We have more competitive league games because it qualifies you for the All Ireland series. So, Division Two and Three become brutal because teams need to get to Division Two to get to Division One. So, the leagues become more uh, more competitive. The provincial knockout stages. I gets more interesting because it's an interesting dynamic whether all teams will go hell for leather for a provincial. The Division 3 and 4 teams certainly will, so it's a wild card chance. And then the group stages, um, like that's a tried and tested model. We've all been, like every player has been crying out for years, why aren't we doing an All-Ireland series that's similar to a World Cup or a, a, or a Champions League? Four groups of four. And like why players didn't like the Super 8s is because you know, eight, eight teams it had a real elite feel because only eight teams got the chance to, to do group stages. We're now 32 teams get a chance of group stages and are competing against teams at their own level. So, like, Jar, it is, it is and, and when players look at it, it is a positive um, step forward in the right direction. Like it's going to be interesting to see how how this one develops, especially on the provincial uh, championship front, uh, Tom. That if it does come out that say some of the top teams in Division One and Two uh, aren't taking this as seriously as some of the lesser teams who are coming from Division Three and Four, and will take this thing as uh, as a wild card opportunity. Like could that actually not be the death knell for the provincial championships, but over a period of time, if you do have your Division One teams perhaps not taking it as some of the the the, the lower division teams, could that could that be trouble for the provinces? Yeah, well, th- I think this is a really good test because, you know, when talking to an awful lot of the Ulster guys and I think every Ulster squad backed Proposal Green, uh, they unanimously said, we will go hell for leather for our Ulster Championship because they love it. They love that competition. Um, similarly, with you know, from a personal point of view, in Mayo, the competitiveness against Galway and Roscommon to win a, a kind of title is not insignificant. So I think this will test the appetite from players um, in, in, and teams and how much they want to win these competitions. But also, something players have been crying out for more games, and this guarantees, I think, 12 games for 24 teams, um, because uh, for 24 teams, five uh, they'll get five championship games. And it forces teams' hands to use their full squad. So like teams typically have 34, 35 players, and in a normal season, because you have league, and then you essentially have every game after the league is essentially um, an absolute knockout game, uh, you don't get to use your full squad. So because there's, there's, there's more of a link and connection between the leagues and the, the championship, you're going to have to use your, your full squad. But I think this will be a test for the provincial competitions. Um, I think, I, think it's, I, I still think they carry a lot of weight. Um, like, and, and, and I think winning, winning a provincial competition in the summer still has that weight and it's still a Connacht or a, a Leinster final. But I do think Division 3 and 4 teams will be incentivized. And like, there's no doubt about it, the Dublins, the Curries will take their finger off the pulse, even a, a few percent. And you might just have more, uh, more diversity of winners in the provincials. And maybe in the long run, that diversity of winners in the provincials will enhance the, the provincials, or maybe it'll be the opposite. Maybe we'll see the, the leagues take front cent, front centre of the season, and the provincials maybe maybe being played before the league. But this is this is the right step um, 
it, this is a step in the right direction because the leagues have been so competitive and we needed to reward the teams that worked their way up to Division 1 and 2 and we needed to re- reward those teams to get into the top tier and, and, and see a pathway to success for all teams. The one concern I would have is that the provincial championships... Um, by the look of the draw you could be on a side of a draw where you end up being a Division 3 or Division 4 team who make it all the way through to provincial final and so therefore you get grandfathered into the the yeah. Sam Maguire whereas you could be a Division 2 team who finishes 4th or 5th in Division 2 in the mid, mid, middle of Division 2 and there could be 3 or 4 teams who use the provincial championships again you need to be very unlucky and it's a it, it's a scenario um, that is unlikely to happen but there could be 3 or 4 teams who make it through the provincial route to a provincial final because the top tier teams are all on the, the other side of the draw. Um, yeah. Like, are, are, do we think provincial championships will be seeded? Yeah, definitely. I think, I think, Jar, like, you, you can't allow one, one side of a provincial draw to be all Division 1 and 2 teams and the other side to be Division 3 and 4 teams. I think similar to Munster where they, where they separate Cork and Kerry, but you have to have a rule where you can't have all Division 1 and two teams going into the same pot on one side of the draw for for fairness like the the provincials need to be a wild card opportunity for division three and four teams because they haven't worked their way up the league to get to division two and for them to get to a provincial final they have to overcome a division two or division one team so like in this structure like the provincials have been given and will be given the autonomy to to structure their competitions as they see fit and certainly from a player's perspective um, they'll be looking to make sure that there is adequate seeding to make sure there's more fairness in in, in competition. But it's, it, it's a point well made. Uh, one last question: the the um, the politics of trying to get something like this through. Tom, we, we saw a very divisive series of arguments, um, and the status of the players, from my perspective, was made clear by some people in the comments they made about. Um, the value that we place on players was was that in any way eye opening for you, or had you come to expect it? Is that just the reality of being involved in the GPA that you're um, you, you're made aware of the fact that there are lots of people within se- senior positions within the within the GA who kind of don't really value the players as as much as I think they should. Yeah, like I think I I, I think over the course of this well my experience with the GPA how how needed is a player's body it's it's really needed like we need to echo the voice of players and proposal B got messages home you know it did it wasn't done in vain I fully believe it did change the mindsets of players and I suppose after special congress the one request players had was to make sure there's a proposal on Congress floor in the following February for players and won the players backed. And in fairness to the GA, they did get two proposals, a red and green, that both that players both liked. Um, and as it is on the, the floor in February, what would be an absolute disaster jar is if proposal green doesn't get through in February for, for some reason. That would be a disaster because in all this consultation, like every the one common thread is players are crying out for change like they need they need green to pass because they need that route to development and success so you know i think it's i think this could be if this passes we could have a very positive 24 months and, and we have to remember over 24 months we'll have a split season which which has been so well welcomed from players and if this passes we'll have a new football structure and a new philosophy towards how leagues are valued and how you're seeded into a tier one and tier two and how there's a pathway to success. So, um, look, to answer your question, I think now more than ever, and in, in any sport, the need for a player's voice and a player's body is really strong. And and look, whatever way the players, you know, want want to go, if the players decided that they didn't want to favour either of these proposals, I need to champion that and just serve their voice. And in this scenario... You know, the majority of players really like green, and we'll just we we'll lobby hard for green between now and Congress. All right, Tom, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Thanks, folks. It's Tom Parsons there, chief executive of the GPA. Uh, Dara says, funny how one big argument by provinces was that the provincials need the link to the All Ireland to be meaningful was nonsense then and still is now. Also had a feeling the two points would put people off red. Proposal B was by far the best. Green is just addition; it's not change. Red wasn't bad, but proposal B was the best actual change. I feel the same in many ways, Dara. I feel like Proposal B is going to be one of those things that we look back on 
in five years' time and go, oh, that's a good idea, maybe we should try that. And maybe in five years' time it'll, uh, it'll be more likely to happen. Declan says, why would people want to get rid of provincials? It will lessen the chance of teams winning silverware and make the All-Ireland the only trophy you can win. Nobody will care about the Talton Cup. Um, like, I don't think anybody was saying get rid of the provincials. They're just saying play them first, right? Well, that was the proposal B thing, of course. Like, um, yeah, first. And it was, like, it was, it was actually going to give more games to the provinces, wasn't it, in terms of a round-robin uh, format? Like, I'm sceptical enough about how that would have looked and how that would have felt. Would it have just felt like the pre-season competitions? Um, well, we, we actually liked the pre-season competitions. We, we liked watching It turns out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that they like, there's loads got... of stories. It's as, and and if, if, if the O'Byrne Cup was actually replaced with is it the O'Keefe, then like teams would try and win those and it would mean something I, I, this is going to be very interesting to see what happens right so let's say you're a division 1 team who has serious All-Ireland aspirations and you play the league it goes well for you you stay in division 1 so therefore you're guaranteed to be in the championship no matter what happens the interprovincial the, the provincial championship comes up you're like a bunch of players here some of whom are injured some of whom are coming back from suspension do I pick my full team if I'm I'm Dublin do I pick my full team to beat Leash and Westmead and Wexford and Mead and Kildare here's the thing I think you do Carlo for those games I, I think you absolutely do and the reason why I think that is that I think we've been conditioned to look at Premier League teams not doing that because they're playing multiple competitions concurrently but then there's the next the next like the round robin will actually be serious matches where at the end of that you're in or out for the All-Ireland series I think you've, you'd certainly you're given your panel a run in the provincial championship in a way that, like, the, the, what you're actually going to do is to value the competition by putting it here. It's a meaningless thing in the middle of the season. I'll be interested to see if the Ulster lads are actually telling the truth about, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm the manager of an All-Ireland winning squad, if I'm Tyrone and this exists, I'm going hell for that in the league, I'm making sure I know exactly what I know, and then I'm using the Ulster Championship, it might, be, it might only be one game in fairness, to try out some stuff and give some game time to players who are fringe players to make sure that they feel like they're involved. And if they win, I'll roll it over and they can play again. But my championship team, for when the first round of the Sam Maguire is, which is weeks away, mm. in this um, three-game series. It is It is only three games in a group of four. It's not home and away, is it? Oh, three games. So that's unfair, as at first started anyway. But anyway. But you see, the thing is, it's it's unfair weighted in favour of the, the number one seed. So like, if you're in your province, it's unfair in favour of you. Um. In the four, in so in f- those four groups of four, there will be a provincial winner. They'll all be separated. Uh, yeah, they all. So if you win your province, you you do get the number one seed. That that's supposed to be the incentive, and you get your home game first. And I might be able to win my because I'm so strong. I might be able to win my province, like if I'm Kerry or Dublin. Well, ideally, yeah, you stay in Division One and you win your province. That's that that would be their agenda. But um, all right, be- all right. It sounds like two split seasons, lads. Says John. And uh, the last one is uh, Dara says, Great to see MMA on the show today. Just to mention, the IMMAF Amateur MMA World Championships are on this very moment. And Jamie Abbott Bissett from Dunamede has just picked up a great win. Uh, so that is your lot from uh, this morning's show. One more thing to, to bring you OTBAM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. I want to tell you what's coming up on um, OTB Sports Radio today. Keith Andrews meets Philly McMahon at one o'clock. We've got Dadcast at three. Lee Dixon's career retrospective at four and OTB Gold is Cora Staunton. Tomas O'Leary is going to be with us tomorrow to talk about the uh, scrum halves and we'll have Deal or No Deal and much more. Right now, Pat Nevin talking about the situation at Everton. Enjoy. You're very welcome along to the Football Show. Great to have you with us. Joe Malloy here this evening. As ever on a Monday, Mr Pat Nevin is on the line. Hey, Pat. How are you doing? Are you well? We are very well. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm, I'm tired because... Uh, I had to drive all the way uh, to London and back from where I live. So that's a 760-mile round trip <laughs> to see a game of football. So uh, it was a decent game, so it was kind of worth it. But it's kind of uh, a weird one because um, the BBC and their wisdom, <laughs> wisdom and other companies and their wisdom have decided we can't fly internally. So that flight was going already. I didn't go on it. I had to drive, so it just made the environment worse. <laughs> so uh, it's one of those ones where uh, the rules don't make sense. But hey, I had a nice drive. And are you a 
audiobook man, podcast man, music man, I suspect maybe you're just uh, silence your own thoughts, Pat. No, no, no. Uh, definitely audiobooks at the moment. Uh, I've just finished Billy Connolly's one, which is cracking. I'm on your Phil K. Dick at the moment, but podcasts, I mean, everywhere. I've just you, you, can, you can never be bored with podcast, podcasts. Um, and of course, the music as well. So I'll be honest with you, like, whisper it because my wife's not here in the room just now. I do like that kind of three or four, five, six, something, seven hours, just driving with your own thoughts. Also gives you ideas as well. So use the time well. It's okay. As long as you don't get stuck in traffic jams, that's a nightmare. And of course, being in London, you're always in a traffic jam. Hmm. So Antonio Conte and Spurs, I think, sick of Chelsea jerseys this month. At this stage, there's just a clear gap between the sides, and that's very apparent. Chelsea, two no winners at Stamford Bridge. Uh, the question I want to ask you first off is that it's five years since Conte played a back four. Tuchel similarly seems to be very wedded to his uh, back three as well. Uh, your guess at the thinking or the logic of both managers respectively going into this game to go to back fours? Um... Well, the funny thing with Chelsea's, Chelsea's was it kind of slightly adapted. I asked somebody in the backroom staff just before the game, what system were you playing? And they said, system singular. Um, and it's a really clever sort of line because, you know, when you're not in possession, it's a different system. So you to play two different systems. So you actually might end up almost as a five when you haven't got the ball. But when you've got ball, it's an obvious back four. Um, Tuchel, to be honest, just adapts to it. They, they sometimes can overthink it, these managers. I think with Conte, I think he was just trying anything. I mean, seeing the team come through from Spurs, there were a lot of defenders in that in that team. But he's thought of everything. You see when it comes right down here, after the amount of times he's played against Chelsea, his comments after the, of the game were very pointed and very obvious to everyone. They've given everything. He's tried every system he's got there's a big old gap between Spurs and where the club want them to be, where he wants them to be, and the quality of players isn't quite there. Um, they can't afford any real you know, injuries. If they're missing so, and that makes a big difference just now. Um, I talked to you the other week there. I went to see them play against Morecambe, and they're playing not exactly the second string, but a number of the players that would be considered the squad miles away absolute miles away from the top level. In fact, Morecambe were one up for most of that game before they bring the, gun, the big guns on. So what Conte has come to this time, and he always comes to Conte, if he tells the management, right, I've done as, as much as I could. He hadn't lost a game in the league before they played Chelsea there since Antonio Conte took over, so he's done well. And he's thinking, they'll look at this and say, oh, we're not far away. And he's thinking, a miles away. I've done an amazing job to stay this close. And it was a real turning point for Spurs. And I I do feel quite sorry for Antonio Conte. He's done a, a really decent job in a short period of time. He shored it up, as I say, on that sort of streak. It was a nine games without losing in the league. But he knows fine well they're miles away. Had they won against Chelsea, which they never looked like it during the game, had they won against Chelsea with the five points behind Chelsea with four games in hand, the worst thing he could have done was win because his owners will say, no, we're not giving you any more money <laughs> and he needs the money. He needs more strength in that squad. So he tried different things in the game and he tried the best he could. He went for a back four. To be honest, he's played back three, back five, everything. It looked like a six at one point uh, against Chelsea there. He'll try everything. But when you get right down here, he's not got good enough players to go and really challenge for the top four. Yeah, on the one hand, I think Conte is a big boy and knows how business works and would realistically not have expected two, three, certainly four big arrivals in January to transform things. And he would be smart enough to say, if we're going to have a big transfer window, it's going to be in the summer. And yet looking at the table, it's a very interesting state of affairs for Daniel Levy. And you think if they were to speculate to accumulate, they really could make Champions League this season. Manchester United are on 38 points after 22 games. Arsenal are game in hand and two points back so if they win their game in hand they would go a point ahead of Manchester United same number of games played Spurs are the interesting one they have two games in hand they could if they were to win their games in hand they could go four clear of United they could go three clear of Arsenal so Spurs, like, if, if Conte was to sit down with Daniel Levy I mean he really can make the point we are in this we could be in the Champions League that will make all our buys in the summer much easier that really gets us up and running now, are you going to back me 
are we going to sit in our hands for six months, sacrifice Champions League and be off to a standing start once again in the summer? I think they really have to think about backing him in a big way this January because they're right in the mix here for Champions League. Yeah, but as Daniel Levy and as the board, a bunch of gamblers. Because it's a gamble and it's a big gamble. You know Man United are capable of going in a run. They don't look like all the time, but they've got enough good players. You know, as a number of good players, Man United have got more than Spurs. So if they get it together under Ranjik, they could, they could still see them off. Can't see Spurs catching, as you say, Liverpool, Man City, probably wouldn't catch Chelsea now. So it's really one between three or four teams there. And, it's you know, is he that much of a gambler that he'll throw that sort of money at it? Because he might throw that sort of money at it and then find United do the same. You know, and he's, he's getting himself in a position where we know Daniel Levy doesn't want to get himself into... And being at that stadium the other week there, I mean, they've spent a lot of money on it, and it's it's, it's fabulous. It's absolutely fantastic. The best, maybe the best, certainly the best in Britain, maybe the best in Europe, arguably the best in the world in world football. It's phenomenal. But you know, the costs of that they don't just disappear because the thing's finished. You know, so there's all sorts of problems that he has to work out as a businessman. But Conte doesn't care about that. That's not his gig. He's never cared about that sort of thing. Everywhere he's ever went, he takes care of what the situation is with number one and he's absolute to right, right to do that from his position because come at the end of the season or come at the, end, the time that he's either leaves or is kicked out people won't think about that they'll think about your position in the league in games won and, and lost and he has to put as much pressure on as he humanly possibly could and that argument you're making is exactly the argument he's got to make mm. but it's still a big big risk to you know go in if it's further debt bigger debt and find yourself you still might not get Champions League I think it's a good gamble rarely you'd say January it's a good time to gamble but with their games in hand they're ahead of United they're ahead of Arsenal and yes United could go and spend money in January but Spurs spending money will make a far bigger difference to Spurs than Manchester United what's another £40 million player to Manchester United's squad at this stage whereas with Spurs I mean he's, 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 he's threadbare so it could make such a colossal difference I, I think he went into the job not expecting big things in January but based on the complexion yeah. of the table I, I would suspect he has now changed his mind and he sees the route through to Champions League and that's him way out of schedule then. Yeah. Oh no, he's got more chips than he had when he started and a lot more chips that he can throw in there and there's a real chance that, you know, he's saying, look, I'm not being a gambler, I've shown you what I'm capable of doing in this short period of time. So yeah, it's worth it. Levy could come back with and I think everyone could say this just now. So what's the market going to be like? Right, it's January. So it's not the greatest market thing. Who else is in the market with us? And then it starts getting ugly if you're Tottenham Hotspur. Because don't be surprised, you know Newcastle are chasing players. Will they get players before Tottenham? Will they be able to pay more money maybe? Um, or make bigger promises in the future? You, you'll see other teams all through the league are interested in where. I wouldn't be surprised if you know, one or two comes in at United, comes in at, you know, Liverpool might actually go for one or two as well, maybe just one. Mm. Liverpool, Chelsea, you know, real teams that will get the nod before anyone else. And Spurs are down that list. But there's teams below. I mean, I'd, if you're a, a football player and you've got a choice between Everton, who will be desperate for players, and Spurs, you'll probably speak, choose Spurs just now. But that's another part of the market you're, you're chasing. And I, again, I think people realise just now that it's never a great market, or rarely a great market. You will pay over the odds. And let's be fair, Daniel Levy paying over the odds are two things that don't generally go together. No, it's what makes this dynamic very interesting. So that's Spurs. Uh, meanwhile, at Stamford Bridge, Pat, is there any word on Thiago Silva? Is he okay? Is there whiplash? How's his back? Uh, I, I'm in a different position here. I was um, co-commenting the game with um, another Chelsea man, which uh, Jason Cundy, and he didn't think it was a penalty. And I thought it was the most... Uh, I, I'm sorry, a free kick. Yeah. I thought it was absolutely clear free kick no, no, no concern not even a question mark over it now people will say that you're just being Chelsea minded to be honest it's not you're going at that sort of pace tiny little shove move momentum and you fly over I've watched it time and time and time again and every single time I watch it it's more obvious it's a free kick you're not allowed to shove people off the ball when you're not going for the ball it's just not allowed especially not with your hand in the back doesn't matter if it's not a big shove you've actually pushed him and he's lost balance yes Thiago Silva knew what he was doing waited for it and made the most of it but he was shoved and I don't think there's much he could do so um, I, I, I know there's a few disagreements with that most of the refereeing fraternity 
that I've talked to, that I've listened to, and that I've read, be exactly the same. They're going, are you joking? That's, that's clearly a failure. You're not allowed to do that, shove someone off the ball. Having said that, there were some ridiculous other calls. Um, I don't know if you saw, if anyone's listening, the, the Aspilicueta getting wrestled in the penalty area. And you're thinking, what? <laughs> there were some strange, um, mm. certainly some strange decisions and that. Spurs can make a big old deal of that. They were second best. They were second best all over the place in, in Chelsea, and particularly, well, obviously, everybody saw what ZH done. And on the day, he was he was stunning. You know, I've not, not seen him like it. And when you're at the game, seeing all the stuff off the ball as well, his movement, his tackling, his work rate, his fitness, his confidence, all that sort of stuff. I'm thinking, who are you? What have you done with Hakim ZH? He's been there for a, for a period of time. Well, yeah. All that different player. He's stunning. Yeah. I would tend to agree with you on the Thiago Silva one, by the way. It's almost a free you hate to see given because he played for it so obviously, but it has to be a free, just uh, even yeah, though it feels, it feels uncomfortable. Uh, Ziyech is absolutely who I wanted to talk to you about. So he's 28 years of age now, Ziyech, and he arrives from Ajax where his nickname is The Wizard and you're expecting good things. And he arrives and instantly you get Riyad Mahrez vibes. You know, so many comparable aspects there. So he's been there since 2020 and still has less than 40 appearances and it, it has never felt like Ziyech bedded in or approached being a mainstay or a man they would turn to or rely on. This is kind of the first time, I would say, this pa- this past week is the first time you've thought Ziyech is more than just a very talented, handy squad player who's, who's never going to be there when they really need him. So what do you think's happened here? Um, well, it could be a number of things. You can make excuses for players. Um, he had a few injuries. He doesn't get a run of games. You look at all the players that are in that position, you know, Mounts played in that position, Pulisic played in that position, Werner can play in that position, Havertz can play in that. He's not got a run of games. Also, I've watched him play well within himself. You're not taking chances, make one mistake and he disappears. So if you've spent your whole, and this isn't football again, this is life. So if you spent your whole career in a job where everybody thinks you're fabulous and you're wonderful and you can do no wrong, well, to some degree you can't do any wrong, i.e. you can make mistakes and people just shrug their shoulders and say, oh, have another go. But when you come into a new a new organisation, a new part of a job, and suddenly you make one or two mistakes, that confidence just, in certain individuals, it just disappears. And it absolutely disappeared with him. He was playing within himself. He was uncertain when it was a, a perfect ball on, a 60-yard, 50-yard ball on, that he would play with his eyes shut with confidence. He wouldn't even try it. He wouldn't even consider it. Um, so... Everything was against him. So he gets a boost of confidence, obviously scores against Brighton there. But I honestly, if I had a guess to have to put it down to one basic 100% thing, it's Tuchel. It's Thomas Tuchel. Thomas Tuchel has just stuck with him recently. And he's obviously seen something in training. Tuchel's big on that training stuff. If you're doing really well in training, you get a game. And it doesn't matter who you are, you get a game. And he's obviously been doing amazing things in training when there's no pressure on I think Tuchel's got him aside and just stood with him and talked to him and said, no, keep on doing that, keep on doing that, keep on doing that. In training, understood, right, and we'll find out how we can get the best out of this guy. Tuchel, like, very much like Guardiola. And obviously, he is the, the, sort of a, the golden man of uh, coaching just now. He, he has projects, and these players can become projects of his. He wants to get them, work on them. My favourite of his was, was probably Raheem Sterling when he got Raheem Sterling and he just made him from a very good player to a player with, you know, almost world class. And for, for a period of time, his goal scoring, his creation, he's getting his head up. He just completely changed what was a very good player and an exceptional player. And he's done that with one or two players at Chelsea as well. I think this is his latest project. He's just thought, no, no, I, th- I think I can get the best out of him. It's taken him a while to get around to it because he was considering others like you know, Werner and Havertz, etc. Pulisic. I think he's just thought, actually, most of them have had good chances. Right, it's your turn, I'll give you a go. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's, I, I was really surprised he stopped by him. I'd have said, I would have said a month ago, ZH was the most likely player to get hoofed out of Chelsea this month. Absolutely. But you've just seen it completely differently. So, yeah, the player's got to work on it, he's got to be confident. But um, when he when he has a game like that, and they call him the magician, but that that left foot as a wand. Yeah. In the first two or three things he did in the game, he just thought, "Oh, you're at it." And as I say, I was sitting beside Jason, and 
he just looked at me we looked at each other and went oh we've not seen that yeah it and was, it 10 was, minutes later he's pinging 70 yards without looking at it just mate, it was lovely to see because he's a fabulous player I, mean, I want to see good players don't, it doesn't matter if players from Chelsea or Man City or anyone I just want to see good players playing at their best and he's He's got a chance to do that. Yeah, and it is great because he, he just has such an obviously high ceiling, you know, because when he first arrived, you could see the Mares comparison and you could see all the different tools he had. It's it's a really fascinating thing, uh, football and confidence and feeling a sense of assur- assurance in your environment because there are certain players at the bigger clubs where it feels like it's the club's stage and the fans' stage and the player is uh, happy to be there. Like Timo Werner. For Timo Werner, I watch him play, he does not feel Stamford Bridge is his stage. And I would have said uh, somewhere yesterday, around the time when he'd scored the first, and then do you remember a ball broke to the edge of the area and he, uh, he you know, trashed one outside of the boot, cut across it and straight at the keeper and the crowd love it and he, he kind of trots on. I, that was um, Ziyech saying, oh, this is my stage now. I've, I've, the balance of power has shifted here from fans and Chelsea to I'm sort of running the show here a little bit. And... It's a beautiful thing to watch that happen with a player sometimes. I'm sure you felt it on certain days. It is. No, absolutely. I know the feeling. When I talk about someone like this, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable knowing exactly what he's going through. And everything you said there was correct. But there's one bit in the middle of it was nailed, absolutely nailed on. Right. So he looked as if he owned it, yeah. But it was the reaction of the fans. Yes. He's not had that reaction. It was, you've absolutely nailed it there. Because when he got that, he, he, he looked a different shape, he stood differently, he ran differently, he just thought, I'm performing to you now. Yeah. And it, it was it's totally different. And it was, it was the fans. And fan, football fans, knowledgeable football fans, and most football fans are going, you know, are knowledgeable and will know when to react right. And also, on top of that, they saw him working hard. So if you've got a guy who's working hard, and then the fans go, oh, we're with you. And then they lift him. And then they see him lifting. It then becomes a symbiotic thing. Where they all just lift higher and higher. And it, you could feel it. You could watch it. It slightly spine tingly when you could see this kind of happening. Um, and it was lovely. It was lovely to see. And again, I underline, it's not, it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter who they play for. They just love to see that happening. And it's 100% it's not been with him. They've, they've never had that reaction from Stamford Bridge fans. And then they knew by half time before he even scored that goal. And I think we'll call it that goal for quite a long time because yeah. the bend on it. It was really weird. I was right behind that goal. Right behind, so right on a line with it. And it's 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 played at great pace. He's had it at an, an enormous kind of curl it. But it's also languid as well. And you can't help but say, the world just stopped. Mm. Everything just stopped and we all went as it went and then it seemed to take an eternity before it went in but it was lashed it, it, honestly it was an absolutely brilliant moment and it was that ability to do these weird different things there was a moment um, during the first half he'd put a couple of great crosses one one in uh, Hudson Adoy but it was on the left hand side and he played one in but he played it at this weird angle it was like arrowed with his left foot pinged and I think don't know anyone else who plays that cross I mean certainly not it Chelsea are very very few people De Bruyne can play it sometimes but rarely does but it's a very odd angled ping that you just don't see you mean yeah. like the fabric Aspen's Arsenal used to do things like that um, it's it gets it's exciting it's really yeah. exciting no, it's, to watch yeah. it's, a, it's, yeah, a, it's a lovely thing when that happens in sport so Everton then there's all sorts of things going on here there's a touch of the old school with Duncan Ferguson buying fans first round of drinks uh, at various uh, pubs outside the stadium you think okay fine it's um, you would think that stuff was just pandering but when Big Dunk does it it goes down very well you have uh, Farid Mashiri releasing statements and putting another 100 million quid onto the balance sheet to ease the debt somewhat but that not really registering with fans even though it's 100 million quid and of course you have Bill Kenwright in the midst of it all pleading with fans flanked by policemen outside the stadium and not getting very far with the fans as you might imagine and they're saying well sack the board and Ken Wright out of our club in the midst of all that would you give Wayne Rooney the job? Do you know I'm struggling who to think to give the job the, the dangers of Wayne Rooney he's, he's a young manager it could go awful do you remember Shearer took over Newcastle? Yeah, when they were in it, it didn't go well, did it? It was great. It was great fun. 
but it didn't go well. No, it didn't, didn't, <laughs> didn't go well, but it was interesting. See, I'm speaking here. I, want, I just want entertainment, so I'm all for it. But And if, if I'm speaking with an Everton hat on and saying, like, uh, and but the, the reason why I'm hesitant is because you had Rafa Benitez, and he's a good manager and a good coach and a good technical coach. Very, very good at all those things. So are you going to get somebody who's higher up the tree than him? I'm not sure at the moment. I don't know how he's around. I don't do, know. Do, if, do you know much about this Vitor Pereira? <laughs> you know, it's one of those classic things. You know, everybody suddenly, if you are hot as a manager for a wee point in time, mm. and they go, oh, you've got this really exciting, and you think, actually, you don't know his capabilities in this league. And this league is the most important part about it. And we've seen so many come over who have the, the hot new thing. And then two months later, they're gone and they're an idiot and they're useless, etc. It's an it's a huge, huge chance to take. If if it was possible, and if it was anyone around, it would be one of the the, the great old coaches who's available, who's out of work and can do do you six months until and saves you. But who is that just now? It was Rafa. Used to be an answer, <laughs> yeah, 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 it would be OTB. AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved